R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 2, Chapters 10 through 17. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 10 A Dusty Horseman Reaches Headquarters. Stewart's information about McClellan's position resolved the ground factor in Lee's equation of an offensive. While Stewart was on the raid, the time factor was brought closer to an answer. Colonel A. R. Bottler, the unofficial envoy of the Army of the Valley, arrived again at Lee's headquarters on the evening of June 14 with a confidential message and a formal dispatch from Jackson. The message was a renewal of the suggestion that Lee bring up Jackson's strength to 40,000 men so that he could invade the North. This, of course, was now out of the question, but Lee discussed it with Bottler. Colonel, he said, don't you think General Jackson had better come down here first and help me to drive these troublesome people away from before Richmond? I think, Bottler answered, that it would be very presumptuous in me, General, to answer that question, as it would be hazarding an opinion upon an important military movement which I don't feel competent to give. Nevertheless, Lee replied, I'd like to know your opinion. Well, if I answer your question at all, said Bottler, it must be in the negative. Why so? inquired Lee. Because, Bottler explained, if you bring our valley boys down here at this season among the pestilential swamps of the Chickahominy the change from their pure mountain air to the miasmatic atmosphere will kill them off faster than the Federals had been doing. That, said Lee, will depend upon the time they'd have to stay here. Have you any other reason to offer? Yes, Bottler rejoined stoutly, and it's that Jackson has been doing so well with an independent command that it seems a pity not to let him have his own way, and then, too, bringing him here, General, will be, to use a homely phrase, putting all your eggs in one basket. I see, Lee said with a kindly laugh, that you appreciate General Jackson as highly as I myself do, and it is because of my appreciation of him that I wish to have him here. Lee then made some inquiries as to conditions in the valley and examined the dispatch bottler delivered. Unfortunately, it was a confusing document. Jackson acknowledged Lee's letter of June 8, in which Lee had hinted that he might call him to Richmond, but he said nothing about the letter of the 11th, wherein Lee had told him he was sending him reinforcements so that he could crush the enemy in his front before joining the Army of Northern Virginia. Yet Jackson said, you can halt the reinforcements coming here if you so desire, without interfering with my plans provided the movement to Richmond takes place. Lee could not tell from this whether Jackson was referring to reinforcements previously mentioned in a general way or to those specifically named in his letter of June 11. Bottler did not know what letters Jackson had received, so, telling the colonel that he would have an answer for him, Lee bade him good night and began to study anew the condition that Stonewall faced. It was clear from Jackson's dispatch that when he wrote on the 13th, he was at Mount Meridian, close to Port Republic, where he had fought his most recent battle. If Jackson had not moved from there, he certainly could not hope to reach the Federals, to attack them, and to return to the railroad in time to reach Richmond before McClellan was ready to open with his heavy guns. Besides, Jackson said in his letter, so far as I am concerned my opinion is that we should not attempt another march down the valley to Winchester until we are in a condition under the blessing of Providence to hold the country. Obviously Lee could not spare troops to hold the lower valley. If, then, a long offensive was dangerous with the forces Jackson had, and if a short offensive could not be completed within the time allowed, the course to follow was to bring Jackson to Richmond at once. Lee accordingly wrote Jackson on the 16th, From your account of the position of the enemy I think it would be difficult for you to engage him in time to unite with this army in the battle for Richmond. If you agree with me, the sooner you can make arrangements to move on Richmond, the better. In moving your troops, you could let it be understood that it was to pursue the enemy in your front. Dispose those to hold the valley so as to deceive the enemy, keeping your cavalry well in your front and at the proper time suddenly descending upon the Pamunkey. To be efficacious, the movement must be secret. Let me know the force you can bring, and be careful to guard from friends and foes your purpose and your intention of personally leaving the valley. Unless McClellan can be driven out of his entrenchments he will move by positions under cover of his heavy guns within shelling distance of Richmond. I know of no surer way of thwarting him than that proposed. <laughs>
I should like to have the advantage of your views and be able to confer with you. We'll meet you at some point on your approach to the Chickahominy. This was the climax approaching. The army was not wholly unprepared for it. Organization had been improved, officers and men were gaining confidence in their new commander, though he used no magic with them beyond that of energy and manifestability, the federal communications were known, the weakest point on McClellan's line had been discovered, such reinforcements as could be had from the valley would soon be on the way. The next step was to work out the precise details of the offensive. Lee lost no time in doing this. A few hours after he had written Jackson, he left his headquarters with Colonel Long and rode out to the north of the Chickahominy. As far as the outposts of the enemy, he made a careful examination of the countryside that swept in a plateau eastward along the northern bank of the protecting stream. Now, Colonel Long, he said, how are we to get at those people? Long was discreet enough to know that Lee was speaking more to himself than to him, and he had no suggestions to make. There was, of course, no question as to the general wisdom of attacking McClellan's exposed right flank. It seemed providentially extended for a turning movement. Davis and Lee had agreed, soon after Johnston had been about to commence such an advance when he had deferred his offensive on receipt of the news that McDowell had started back to Fredericksburg. Johnston, however, had intended to attack south of the Chickahominy at the same time that he assaulted north of the river. The question now to be decided was whether Lee should launch his drive on both sides of the stream or should maintain a strict defensive on the south side of the Chickahominy and transfer the greater part of the Confederate army north of the river to cooperate with Jackson. Lee said nothing of this to Long, but when he returned to headquarters, Longstreet called and, by odd coincidence, proposed that Jackson be brought down from the valley and be hurled against the Federal right. Lee had no hesitation in confiding to Longstreet that this had already been ordered and he sketched a plan for an attack north and south of the river. From his own painful experience at Seven Pines, Longstreet knew something of the difficulties of bringing the whole Army of Northern Virginia simultaneously into action, and he raised the practical question of what would happen if, for any reason, the frontal attack south of the Chickahominy were delayed when Jackson advanced. Might not the enemy concentrate overwhelmingly against Jackson and drive him back against the Pamunkey, the fords and bridges of which it was reasonable to assume a vigilant enemy had destroyed? Lee weighed this objection and, on the strength of it, at length decided to move the greater part of his troops north of the river while a small force defended the works on the south side against a possible federal attack. When Lee next met Davis, he laid this plan before him. The president was quick to ask if Lee thought McClellan would quietly permit him to take the initiative north of the Chickahominy and not deliver a counterattack south of the river against Lee's weakened center and left? The line south of the river, he said, was much too weak to sustain long assaults. If McClellan was the man he had taken him to be when he had been Secretary of War and had appointed him a member of the Military Commission to observe the war in the Crimea, McClellan would march into Richmond. If, on the other hand, said Davis, the federal commander acted like an engineer officer and considered it his first duty to protect his line of communication, then he would not attack, and Lee's plan would work out successfully. Lee fired a bit at the suggestion that engineer officers were likely to make such mistakes and for the moment was in the humorous position of defending his opponent, a fellow engineer of the old army, but he had a better answer, if, said he, you will hold as long as you can at the entrenchment, and then fall back on the detached works around the city, I will be on the enemy's heels before he gets there. This was not bravado, but a well-reasoned conclusion. It was based in part on Lee's knowledge of McClellan. In larger degree, it was founded on the belief that if he could once drive McClellan eastward on the north side of the Chickahominy, till he passed New Bridge, he had nothing to fear on the south side. For New Bridge, which was about three and a half miles below the crossing of the Mechanicsville Turnpike, was not far from the Confederate lines on the south side of the river. Once in control of that bridge, Lee felt that he could easily reinforce that part of his command south of the river or get in the rear of McClellan's forces there if they attempted an advance on Richmond. The outcome fully justified Lee in this. By this time, the atmosphere of camp and of city was one of expectancy. Everyone in authority had the air of knowing a secret. Hints of an early offensive kept men from being wholly cast down by the news that Fort Pillow on the Mississippi had been abandoned on June 4 and that Memphis had been occupied by the enemy on the 6th. In the lull of waiting for his plan to be executed, Lee found time to write a few domestic letters in his usual playful spirit. 
In one of them, he answered the inquiries of his daughter-in-law about his personal appearance in uniform and beard, assuring her that an uglier person you have never seen, and so unattractive is it to our enemies that they shoot at it whenever visible to them. He concluded, calmly, our enemy is quietly working within his lines and collecting additional forces to drive us from our capital. I hope we shall be able yet to disappoint him and drive him back to his own country. This was on June 22. A great part of the next day Lee spent at the Dab's house. During the forenoon, he sent off couriers with sealed dispatches to three division commanders, Longstreet, D. H. Hill, and A. P. Hill. Then he transacted army business. About 3 p.m., two dusty horsemen rode up the lane on weary, panting horses and halted at the fence. One of them stiffly dismounted, gave his steed to the other and walked to the house with long strides. It was Jackson. Chapter 11, Lee Seizes the Initiative After receiving Lee's letter by Bottler, Jackson had elaborately masked his movements and, on the evening of June 17, had left his old battleground. At Charlottesville, he had awaited the arrival of his troops. Delayed at Gordonsville all day of the 20th by a report that the Federals were advancing from the Rapidan, he had then moved his men rapidly down the Virginia Central Railroad on 10 trains of 18 to 20 freight cars each. On Sunday, the 22d, he had arrived at Fredericks Hall ahead of his men and had spent the day attending religious meetings. The first of the trains had proceeded a few miles farther to Beaver Dam, where the regiments had left them. That evening Jackson had gone to the room assigned him by his host, Nat M. Harris, but, without retiring, he had waited till the Sabbath was ended. Then, at 1 a.m., he had left and, on relays of commandeered horses had covered the 52 miles to Lee's headquarters in 14 hours. Finding that Lee was at work when he arrived, Jackson refused to interrupt him and waited in the yard of the house, leaning heavily against the fence, his head bowed and his cap pulled down over his face as if to conceal his identity. Presently D. H. Hill rode up, for Lee had received advance notice of Jackson's coming and it had been to summon Hill and two other division commanders to a council of war that Lee had sent off couriers earlier in the day. D. H. Hill and Jackson had married sisters and they were close friends, but Hill could hardly have been more surprised at seeing him if Stonewall, in all the new fame of his Valley campaign, had dropped out of one of McClellan's troublesome observation balloons. They talked for a few minutes, and then went into Lee's private office, the rear of the two rooms on the first floor. Lee was awaiting them and offered the tired Jackson some refreshment, but the traveler would take only a glass of milk. In a short time, Longstreet and A.P. Hill arrived, and Lee closed the door. Lee had already made the momentous decisions regarding the offensive, but much remained to be discussed in an historic council of war that brought together for the first time all the men who were to direct the opening battle. D. H. Hill was to remain with Lee only a few months. The others were to lead his corps and execute his orders until two of them were killed and only Longstreet remained to say farewell at Appomattox. They afforded an interesting contrast, Longstreet, 41, low of stature, heavy, slightly deaf, and strongly self-opinionated, D. H. Hill, of the same age as Longstreet, small, somewhat stooped, critical and caustic but wholly devoted, A. P. Hill, 37, of nervous, quick temperament, exhibiting excellent qualities as an administrator, but quite recently put at the head of a division and untested as yet in that position, and, finally, the gaunt, bearded Jackson, age 38. Quiet and soft-spoken, neither able in conversation nor magnetic in manner, and bearing in repose no mark of genius. A month before, to the very day, he had struck banks at Front Royal in the second phase of his Valley campaign, and now, in the glamour of Winchester, Cross Keys, and Port Republic, he was possessed of a greater measure of public esteem than Lee enjoyed. All four of the men were West Point graduates. Longstreet had been a captain and a paymaster when, in 1861, he had resigned from the Union Army. I. P. Hill had been a captain in the Coast Survey. D. H. Hill, like Jackson, had left the service before that time to become a college professor. Lee did not give his lieutenants time to ponder these things. Promptly and briefly, he explained the conclusions to which he had come. These were 1. Richmond could not be successfully defended in a formal siege. 2. It was necessary, therefore, to prevent a siege by assuming the offensive. 
3. The offensive could not take the form of a direct assault on the federal positions because the attacking troops were inexperienced, the positions were strong, and the Union artillery was too powerful. 4. If there could be no direct assault, there must be a turning movement. 5. This was invited by the fact that McClellan was astride the Chickahominy, with his forces divided by that stream. 6. McClellan's right wing, north of the Chickahominy, could be more readily attacked than his left wing south of that stream. 7. A successful attack north of the river would soon threaten McClellan's line of communications via the York River Railroad, with his base at the White House, because the railroad crossed the Chickahominy at Dispatch Station, which was only 12 miles in rear of McClellan's right. The federal commander would then be forced either to call his whole army to the north side of the Chickahominy to defend his base, or else he would have to withdraw from the north side of the river and seek a new base on James River. 8. To overwhelm the Union right, north of the Chickahominy, it would be necessary to concentrate very heavily there. There were only three difficulties in the way. First, as Mr. Davis had pointed out, there was risk that the Federals might attack south of the river while the greater part of the Confederate Army was north of that stream. Secondly, if the Federal right rested on Beaver Dam Creek, that would be a difficult position to attack directly. Thirdly, the Unionists were on good ground and could dispute the crossing of the Meadow Bridges and the Mechanicsville Bridges, over which Lee would have to pass three of his divisions. How could these difficulties be overcome? Jackson was to move his army to Ashland, 16 miles north of Richmond. Then, on the day before the battle opened, he was to march southeast. This would put him above the Chickahominy so that he would not be troubled by that watercourse. Stuart was to cover his left. Very early on the day of the action he was to start a march that would carry him past the head of Beaver Dam Creek as he moved toward Cold Harbor en route to attack McClellan's line of communications. In this way, he would turn the troublesome stream and overcome one of the three difficulties. The army should not and would not have to fight for the high ground along the creek. As Jackson's march would be at some distance from the Chickahominy, a P. Hill, whose division was opposite the Meadow Bridges, was to send a brigade under General L. O. B. Branch up the Chickahominy to a place known as Half Sink. When Jackson started his march on the day of battle, Branch was to move to the enemy's side of the Chickahominy and advance toward Mechanicsville. In this way, he would establish contact with Jackson and would brush aside any outposts that might molest Jackson's right flank. And, finally, as he moved down the river, Branch would uncover the meadow bridges. When this was done, a P. Hill would cross at the meadow bridges and would advance on Mechanicsville he would have sufficient force to clear the enemy from that village and thereby would open the Mechanicsville bridges to D. H. Hill and Longstreet. This would complete the removal of Lee's second difficulty. D. H. Hill would then march past A. P. Hill's rear and form in support of Jackson. Thereupon Longstreet would cross and take position in support of A. P. Hill. By this time, Jackson would have turned Beaver Dam Creek on his way to Cold Harbor, and from left to right the advancing force would be in echelon as follows. Stuart. Jackson. D. H. Hill. A. P. Hill. Longstreet. The attack would progress down the Chickahominy and would have as its intermediate objective the federal position in front of New Bridge. When this was stormed, the last of the known difficulties would be removed. Contact with the Confederates on the south side would be re-established and the danger of a successful Federal attack on that bank of the river would be passed. The advancing columns could press on toward the final objective, the York River Railroad. The two divisions of Huger and Magruder that were to be left in front of Richmond while the rest of the army went to the north side were to demonstrate on the day of battle. If they needed help, they were to call on the commands of General Holmes and General Wise who were on either side the James, and if the enemy withdrew from their front, Huger and Magruder were to pursue vigorously. Graphically, the various movements are represented on page 113. Having explained all this, Lee did something he had never done before and was never to do again, he excused himself for a time and left his subordinates to discuss among themselves the proposed movement. Doubtless he felt this was safe, in dealing with four professional soldiers of experience, and perhaps he thought it desirable that they should feel free to analyze and criticize his plan so that each might understand precisely what was expected of him.
When Lee returned, after some time, he was told that the four had agreed to launch the offensive on June 26. It is not certain he was informed that Jackson had first stated that he would be in position to attack on the 25th but had been urged by Longstreet to set the following day for the turning movement. The conference adjourned about nightfall and Jackson set out at once to spend another sleepless night in the saddle, returning to his command. His ruse on leaving the valley had served its purpose well in mystifying the Federals in the valley. His ride to Richmond and his departure, the approach of his division and its intended participation in the battle were supposed to be secrets, but a garrulous Confederate quartermaster, however, had remarked that all the cars on the Virginia Central Railroad had been sent westward to transport Jackson to Richmond, and in this way the news had reached many people in Richmond. What information McClellan had received, and whether the turning movement by Jackson would surprise him, was, of course, unknown to the Confederates and indeterminable until the day of battle. Lee's hope was that the movement of Whiting and Lawton to the valley had become known but that the advance of Jackson had not been reported to his adversary. On the 24th, Lee personally drafted his general order and had it distributed, for he was determined not to repeat the misunderstandings of Seven Pines by the issuance of verbal instructions to one commander, of which the cooperating officer might be ignorant. Unfortunately, in an effort to condense the language of the order, Lee did not make it altogether unambiguous. He said that a P. Hill was to cross the meadow bridges as soon as the movements of Jackson and Branch were discovered. Did this mean that Hill was to cross when he discovered that Jackson and Branch had started from their stations or when he discovered that they were opposite Meadow Bridge? Again, Lee said, at 3 o'clock Thursday morning, 26th instant, General Jackson will advance on the road leading to Pole Green Church, communicating his march to General Branch. Then he proceeded to explain the crossing of the divisions from the south side. Nothing more was said of Jackson until the order directed that D. H. Hill move to the support of Jackson then followed this language. The four divisions, keeping in communication with each other and moving en echelon on separate roads, if practicable, the left division in advance, with skirmishers and sharpshooters extending their front, will sweep down the Chickahominy and endeavor to drive the enemy from his position above New Bridge, General Jackson bearing well to his left, turning Beaver Dam Creek and taking the direction toward Cold Harbor. Was this plain? Would Jackson understand it? Was there danger of two interpretations? Lee made the disposition of the artillery the subject of special instructions. Whiting had taken only two batteries with him to the valley. The remainder of the artillery of Smith's former division was assigned to Magruder's division, raising his total to 13 batteries. Lee did not detach any of this ordnance for the offensive, as Magruder had a long line to defend. Huger had six batteries. The reserve artillery of 23 batteries was placed under its chief, Brigadier General W. N. Pendleton, to be used for three purposes, namely, 1. To deal with any emergency, 2. To defend the lines on the south side of the Chickahominy, and 3. To support the attack north of the river, as occasion might require. If none of this reserve artillery had to be sent to the north side, Lee would have 126 guns to hold off any federal offensive south of the Chickahominy. The attacking divisions, which were not overgunned, were to carry their regular artillery units with them into action. A major factor in the operations Lee projected in these orders was the character of the terrain. His field lay between the James and the Pamunkey with the Chickahominy roughly midway between them. All three of the rivers have a general course from northwest to southeast. The average distance from the Pamunkey to the Chickahominy, in this zone, is 7 miles, and from the Chickahominy to the James 9 miles. The country is flat, in the main, except where the watercourses cut their way. Rain is slow to run off. Along the streams, there are bluffs and wide valleys in some places, and at others the creeks run in narrow, deep ravines. The swamps that gained a sinister name in the campaign were then confined to the valley of the Chickahominy and to a few small creeks or rivulets that lost their way in flats overgrown with a tangle of small trees and bushes. The picture of vast, impassable swamps, with mighty cypress trees and tropical vegetation, was wholly imaginary. In dry weather, when the streams were low, infantry could pass through almost any part of the swamps and would only require a footbridge. In a wet season, the water filled the bottoms and mired the roads.
two-thirds of the country was wooded, and as the farms were comparatively small, there were scores of narrow roads amid which marching columns could easily lose their way. These roads, little known and poorly mapped, were to prove the chief obstacle to rapid advances and were to explain many things which, if they had occurred in an open country, would have to be written down as inexcusable failures. Rain had fallen on the 23d and it continued on the 24th, but as the roads had previously dried out and as the temperature was high, there was nothing to indicate that the weather would hold up the movement. The only pressing duty that remained to be performed was to see that the six excellent North Carolina regiments of Ransom's Brigade, then in Petersburg, were brought on to Richmond. Lee decided to employ them with Huger's division on the Williamsburg Road, and he could safely assume that they would be in position early on the morning of June 25th. The arrival of these troops gave Lee a total effective strength of about 67,000 men. Jackson would bring 18,500, including Whiting and Lawton, so that Lee hoped to open the battle with about 85,000 soldiers of all arms. Of this number, Lee intended to employ some 56,000, cavalry included, against the federal right flank north of the Chickahominy. It was a much larger force than, a month previously, it had seemed possible for the Confederates to gather in front of Richmond. The organization of the army for the movement was to be as follows. Attack divisions, north of the Chickahominy. Cavalry, covering the left of the turning column. J. E. B. Stewart, about four regiments, 1,800 men. Left, turning column. T. J. Jackson's own division, four brigades. R. S. Ewell's division, three brigades and the Maryland line. W. H. C. Whiting's division, two brigades. Total, nine brigades, nine batteries, 18,500 men. Left support. D. H. Hill's division, five brigades, seven batteries, 9,000 men. Center. A. P. Hill's division, six brigades, nine batteries, 14,000 men. Right. James Longstreet's division, six brigades, one battalion of artillery, 9,000 men. Defense divisions, south of the Chickahominy. J. B. Magruder's division, six brigades, 13 batteries, 12,000 men. Benjamin Huger's division, three brigades, six batteries, 9,000 men. Defense Divisions on James River North, H. A. Wise's Command, 3 Regiments, 4 Batteries, 1,500 Men T. H. H. Holmes's Division, 3 Brigades, 6 Batteries, 6,500 Men Reserve Artillery W. N. Pendleton Commanding, 23 Batteries, 3,000 Men Cavalry, South of the Chickahominy about three and a half regiments, on the Nine Mile Road and the roads as far south as James River, 1,200 men. On the strength of his opponent, Lee had no definite information, though in May or early June he had estimated the federal strength at 150,000 or more. He was convinced, in any case, that McClellan's losses at Seven Pines had been made good, and that the Unionists heavily outnumbered him. He expected, however, to concentrate on the north side of the Chickahominy a force superior to that which the Union commander-in-chief had left there. The 25th dawned with the rain still falling intermittently but not heavily enough to cause concern for the roads. It was to be a busy day, for Jackson was doubtless on the march, and the divisions of A. P. Hill, Longstreet, and D. H. Hill were to cook three days' rations preparatory to moving that night. Scarcely had routine camp duties been discharged than there came a development not on the schedule. The Federal artillery opened on a wide front north and south of the Chickahominy. Soon word reached Lee that the Federals were attacking the pickets along the Williamsburg Road and were driving them in. What did it mean? Had McClellan learned of the approach of Jackson? Was he launching an attack to spoil Lee's plan? The attack was on Huger's front, and he was not at his quarters. Worse still, the movement was directed, in part, against some of Ransom's troops who had arrived that morning and had never been under fire before. Reassurance was given Lee later in the morning, with the indications that the Federals were seeking nothing more than to advance their picket line beyond a no-man's land in the middle of a forest. But Lee was not wholly satisfied, and he rode over to the Williamsburg Road to examine the situation for himself.
By doing so, he missed a visit from President Davis. Once on the ground, he found, despite the inexperience of some of the units, that the men were fighting admirably. He did not think, however, that the affair had been well handled by the officers in command. This action raised a question, should Lee execute his plan for a battle the next day, or should he await the development of the enemy's movement? Studying such information as he had, he concluded that McClellan was not attacking because he was aware of Jackson's advance, but that the federal commander would certainly assume the offensive very shortly. Ordering General Huger to hold his lines the next morning at any cost and to advance if possible, Lee let his plan for the offensive stand. It was an audacious decision, but it was based on the belief that the best way to avoid an attack was to deliver one. Toward evening, the charges and countercharges on the Williamsburg Road ended with the Confederate main line untouched. The artillery fire, which had continued vigorously on the north side of the church, at length fell away. The rain had ceased, too, and as the anxious people of Richmond looked out from the housetops, they saw a rainbow covering the camps of their defenders. It was an omen, the superstitious affirmed. Yet there were many who had no faith in the omen or in the commander of the army. Critics were still to be found on every corner, those who had doubted Lee's qualities of command continued to murmur so dubiously that his admirers had to defend him. At that very hour, perhaps, the editor of the Richmond Inquirer was writing for his next day's paper an appeal for confidence in Lee. Impatient critics, he said, are still busy with comments upon a policy, the facts leading to which they do not know, and upon which, if they did, they could form no reliable opinion. Back through the fading rainbow, unmindful of critics, Lee returned to his headquarters. For part of the way he went over the road he and Davis had traveled that last night in May, not quite four weeks before, when the president had told him he wished him to assume command of the army. Then the fields and the highways had been full of the wounded, victims of a bungled battle that only the optimist could style a victory. Now, under the summer stars, in the meadows, the men were lighting their campfires, and the teamsters were feeding their horses in the knowledge that the cooking of three days' rations meant a new battle. What could Lee have thought as he rode silently by, and heard the echo of the soldiers' banter, the music of their boyish laughter? At the Dab's house, the servants were packing the camp equipage and the office was ready to be abandoned, for, with the dawn, headquarters would be in the field, and none could say where sunset would find them on the morrow. Lee ate his supper, received the last reports, wrote a letter to President Davis, telling him of the affair on the Williamsburg Road, questioned the staff once more about the movements of the troops that night, and then sought a few hours' sleep. The eve of the great struggle for the possession of Richmond, the eve of the first battle Lee had ever directed under the Southern flag. Was everything prepared? Had he forgotten any essential? Would he have the advantage of surprise, or was the enemy at that hour preparing for him? The column that was to make the turning movement was strong enough, the force he would hurl against the enemy's right certainly outnumbered the Federal brigades north of the Chickahominy, the artillery was prudently apportioned, the attacking divisions were well led, the general staff had done its work carefully, the wagon train would not be long. If Magruder and Huger put up a bold front, they would be able to hold off the enemy until Lee's advance had passed New Bridge. Then, if the Federals attempted to drive into Richmond, he would recross the river and be on their heels, just as he had promised the President he would be. But, was he expecting too much of inexperienced staff officers? The only maps that the engineers had prepared were little more than sketches, would they suffice, were they accurate? Were the roads so narrow and so numerous, in a tangled country, that they would confuse the commanders? Above all, was the plan understood? Was it subject to two interpretations in any particular? Was it overcomplicated? It provided for the convergence on the heights of the Chickahominy of columns that were to approach by three routes, Jackson's turning column after a long march from the north, it P. Hill across Meadowbridges, Longstreet and D. H. Hill by way of Mechanicsville Pike. Would they meet at the same time and on the appointed line, or? It was getting late, the birds were beginning to stir, that low, continuous sound was the creaking of the complaining wagons on the road, that muffled pulsing, as regular as the beat of an untroubled heart, was the tramp of D. H. Hill's men on the way to their rendezvous. The day of battle had come. Chapter 12, Where is Jackson? Mechanicsville.
Day dawned fair and pleasant on June 26, one of the flawless mild summer mornings that often follow thunderstorms in eastern Virginia. Lee was early astir. Notice was sent to the president that headquarters would be on the Mechanicsville Turnpike, and the Secretary of War, similarly advised, was told to call on the troops guarding the James River waterline if he needed assistance in repelling any attack by the federal forces south of the Chickahominy. Bad news came with breakfast. Down the river, opposite New Bridge, artillery fire broke out hotly and lasted half an hour. From Jackson arrived a dispatch explaining that his command had been delayed in its march and had not reached Ashland until the evening of the 25th, whereas the plan had stipulated that the divisions were to camp that night west of the Central Railroad between Ashland and Richmond, about six miles nearer the chosen field of battle. That was a poor beginning for the advance, and it could not be wholly redeemed by the assurance Jackson gave that he would start at 2.30 on the morning of the 26th. At best, Jackson could not cross the railway until 6 o'clock, three hours late. Jackson reported, also, that his cavalry pickets had been driven in and that the telegraph wire had been cut near Ashland. That was ominous. Perhaps the plan had been discovered. The attack of the previous day on the Williamsburg Road might have been delivered in order to discover whether the Confederate forces on that sector had been reduced for a concentration north of the Chickahominy. Lee's apprehension increased, but his purpose was not shaken. He would go on. From the Dabbs house he rode over to the Mechanicsville Turnpike, out of which the regiments of D. H. Hill and Longstreet were streaming. The artillery had been sent ahead, and the campfires had been replenished along the front the men had left in order to create the impression that the former lines were still occupied in full strength. By 8 a.m. all the units of the two divisions were in position, masked, behind the crest of the hills overlooking the Chickahominy from the south. Lee rode out to an advanced artillery position and surveyed the verdant panorama. He was on one of the high points of the Long Heights, which ran roughly from west to east. Half a mile away, in front of him, the two channels of the Chickahominy, so insignificant in drought, so formidable in flood, meandered through a wide, boggy meadow, fringed with trees not so high as those that mar the view today. Straight down from the eminence where Lee stood, across two broken bridges and then northward up the other side, like the shaft of an arrow, ran the sandy Mechanicsville turnpike to the little village whose name it bore, a village perched midway a row of hills almost as elevated as that on which Lee stood. Mechanicsville was thus in the center of the scene. It occupied a magnificent site and was an important crossroads, but in itself it was a poor place. Its half-dozen houses, residences, stores, and saloon had been badly treated by the moving armies. On the west of the turnpike was a grove that had been cleared of underbrush, and in the farther fringe of this grove was a looted and deserted beer garden. East of the road stood the best and least damaged house of the village. Flower beds adorned its front yard, honeysuckle and woodbine ran on a trellis over the porch. From the yard a large vegetable garden stretched toward the river. On either side of the village, the land formed a slightly rolling plain, clear for a mile to the eastward and for a mile and a half to the westward, except for low thickets along the course of the few small streams that flowed down to the Chickahominy through shallow ravines. North and east of these fields, which the frequent rains had kept green under the summer sun, spread woodlands of oak and of pine, broken here and there by clearings and dotted at intervals with the white dwellings of the planters. West of the village the crossing opposite the meadow bridges was hidden by the trees. About a mile east of Mechanicsville, scarcely observable amid the surrounding growth, was the declivity through which ran the often-mentioned Beaver Dam Creek, where the main federal position was supposed to be. Fed by several branches that had their source two miles or more up the watershed, the stream wandered through ravines until it found its way into the Chickahominy. The panorama was as pleasant as could be found in many a mile. At intervals, newly dug parapets stood out from the verdure, for the Federal artillery commanded the hills on the south side. In the village, through strong binoculars, blue-coated infantry could be seen, along the ridge, at intervals, little knots of horsemen might be picked out in the field of the glasses, afar off, McClellan's observation balloons were in the air. But so quiet was the landscape, in the clear morning light, that it was hard to realize that war gripped the countryside, or that thousands of armed men would soon be struggling across it. Observers on the Richmond side of the valley did not gaze long to the east, or even at the village. Their thought was of meadow bridges, where a P. Hill was waiting.
From the woods opposite that point, there might break out at any time the fire of the skirmishers of Branch's brigade. This command, it will be recalled, had been sent to half sink. Its instructions were to cross the Chickahominy and to move on Mechanicsville, clearing the road for hills crossing at the Meadow Bridges, as soon as the movements of Jackson and of Branch were discovered. If Jackson were delayed in crossing the railroad, it followed that Branch would be later in marching on Mechanicsville than had been contemplated in orders, but no further word had come from him or from Jackson. It would be afternoon before the village could be taken. Still, the sun did not set until 7.17, and Lee would have at least six hours in which to drive the Federals. Everything depended on Jackson and on Branch. Jackson was a known quantity, Branch was a man of 41, a Princeton graduate, a former congressman and not a professional soldier, but he had some knowledge of the country and had acquitted himself well in the action at Hanover Courthouse. It would have been better, perhaps, if the important liaison with Jackson had been entrusted to a more experienced officer. Noon at last, by the chiming of far-off Richmond bells, no sound of battle from the north side, no smoke, no dust as of a moving column. Major Richardson on the outermost redoubt south of the Chickahominy and adjoining the turnpike reported that he believed the enemy was leaving the earthworks on the opposite heights, but he was not certain. Another anxious hour crept by, and another. The President, the Secretary of War, and a number of public men had ridden out. There was enough of conversation and of high company. But to Lee, the suspense must have been akin to that of the tortured morning on the flank of Cheat Mountain nine months before, when he had waited so long for the sound of the volleys that Colonel Rust had never ordered. The stakes were so immeasurably vaster now. The sun was beginning to slant. The shadows were creeping eastward. Three o'clock was drawing on, and it began to look as if the whole plan might have to be cancelled, for the Federals who had driven in Jackson's pickets had certainly reported his advance by this time. Knight would give McClellan opportunity of covering his threatened flank with strong reinforcements from the south side. The fates that thus far had kept Lee from fighting a single battle seemed to be leagued once more against him. At three o'clock, and how long it was in coming! Major Richardson reported that he was satisfied the enemy was evacuating the gun positions immediately opposite him. With Longstreet and D. H. Hill, Lee went out on the redoubt to see for himself. Although there was some movement around Mechanicsville, there was nothing definite, nothing to indicate any sudden alarm. The hour had not long passed when there rolled down the valley a rattle of musketry. Blue-coated figures began to emerge from the fringe of woods on the far side of the river, below the meadow bridges. The attack was being delivered at last. Quickly on the heels of the Federals a Confederate skirmish line appeared. Behind the skirmishers the woods seemed suddenly alive with men, spreading rapidly northward. They halted, formed line of battle, and began to sweep eastward toward Mechanicsville. The effect was electric. The village and the country round about woke up with a start. Bugles echoed. Horsemen sprang to saddle. A line was quickly formed at Mechanicsville. From the fields behind the earthwork where Lee was watching, the lounging soldiers of D. H. Hill and Longstreet sprang up. Orders rang out. The gunners stood to their pieces, anxiously awaiting the word of command. The Confederate line on the other side of the river was now moving steadily eastward, almost unopposed by the fleeing Federals. Soon it was evident that some of Hill's artillery had reached the road that led from the meadow bridges toward Mechanicsville, for while the road could not be seen, the boom of guns could be heard from beyond the advancing infantry and the smoke of their fire was visible. There was other smoke, too, across the Chickahominy. Rising faintly over the village and far beyond the federal line, it was in a most significant position, directly on the line of Jackson's expected advance. His guns must be in action, Stonewall and his famous valley soldiers must be close at hand. Late as it was, the plan seemed now to be working out. Hill was coming down the heights to clear the Mechanicsville bridges, and Jackson would soon be turning Beaver Dam Creek. If the summer sun lingered long enough, victory might still be won. A. P. Hill's advancing line was nearing Mechanicsville now. No federal batteries remained on the plain to oppose it. The federal infantry, which manifestly was not strong, was withdrawing rapidly toward the eastward. 
but as the Confederates approached Mechanicsville, a heavy artillery fire was opened upon their columns. Evidently, the Federals behind Beaver Dam Creek were ready for them. The whole stream seemed to be covered with the smoke of the Union batteries. Hill must not advance too far before Jackson turned the creek. Otherwise, he would be torn to pieces. Quickly Lee called to him one of D. H. Hill's volunteer aides who knew the country, Lt. Thomas W. Sidner of the 4th Virginia Cavalry, and ordered him to ride at once to A. P. Hill and direct him to suspend all movement until further orders. On Hill went to the village, the fire upon him heavier every minute. On his left, the shells were taking his men almost in flank. He began to maneuver in that direction. The situation was becoming confused. The firmness of the Federal stand on Beaver Dam Creek did not indicate that Jackson was close enough at hand to turn that stream at its headwaters. What was wrong? For a clock found Hill in the village. The turnpike was cleared. D. H. Hill could cross at last and go to support Jackson, if Jackson were there. Longstreet would follow and form on a P. Hill's right. Down the hill from the south side went D. H. Hill's leading brigade. Lee's outspoken Carolina critic, General R. S. Ripley, was leading it. Soon he reached the first of the two broken bridges over the Chickahominy. A few planks were thrown across it. The troops hurried on. At the second bridge, there was a longer delay, but soon the Georgians and North Carolinians were climbing the hill toward Mechanicsville. Ripley's artillery was to follow him before another brigade of infantry took the road. The batteries were ready. They made the first difficult crossing. The second was too much for them. No pioneers were at hand, someone had blundered about that. The gunners had to turn bridge builders. Half an hour was lost. While the men were still struggling in the water, an insistent cavalcade came down to the bridge and passed on over. At its head was President Davis, riding, as always, to the sound of firing. With him were excited staff officers, cabinet members, and politicians. Lee had waited to see the column well underway. Owing to the delay in repairing the span at the second bridge, it was nearly five o'clock before he left Richardson's battery position to cross the river. When he arrived at Mechanicsville, he found chaos. Hill, he discovered, had not waited till Jackson and Branch were opposite the Meadow Bridges. Instead, Hill had despaired of their arrival, had disregarded his orders, and had moved on his own responsibility. He did not know where Jackson was, did not know when Stonewall would turn the creek and force a withdrawal of those fiendish batteries that were tearing his ranks. The village was his. Only federal dead and wounded remained west of Beaver Dam Creek. But what good did this do? The ground was completely open. The men had no cover. The enemy's fire was on a wide arc. The few guns that Hill could put into position seemed to make no impression on the enemy. Hill had carried out his orders and had formed a line of battle for general advance to the eastward on a front of about a mile and a quarter. This had availed little. In the face of the continuous fire, some of the regiments had gone forward to the edge of the declivity of Beaver Dam Creek, where there was some cover, even if the ground was within range of the Federal infantry. Where these troops found lodgment a wild, bootless battle was in progress along the creek. Only part of one brigade had been able to cross, and it had accomplished nothing. The others barely held the fringe of the thicket facing the stream. Some commanders had halted their men and had made them lie down in line, as they could not hope to storm the Federal position or live in the open. Fortunately, the enemy's artillery fire was a little high, else the whole division would have been slaughtered. All over the plain, the spiteful shells were bursting in fury. Riders went down, horses were slain, guns were disabled. Many of the green troops were in a frenzy. Lee sat through it all as if he thought he was invulnerable. Nearby, though, was the president, with members of his cabinet and a coterie of politicians. One explosion might kill all of them. They must go to a place of safety. Lee rode over to Davis. Mr. President, he asked with a frigid salute, who is all this army and what is it doing here? Davis knew what Lee meant. He squirmed in his saddle.
It is not my army, General, he said. It is certainly not my army, Mr. President, and this is no place for it. Davis was stunned. Well, General, if I withdraw, perhaps they will follow me. He lifted his hat and rode down the hill. His companions, crestfallen, trooped after him. He disappeared, and Lee did not know till later that Davis had gone only far enough to get out of his sight. Then he halted quickly, but not before a soldier at his feet had been killed by an exploding shell. Evening was drawing on, what could be done? It was Lee's to decide. He expected Jackson's turning movement against the federal right to begin at any moment. The whole army was so confident of Stonewall's immediate arrival that some of the troops were told that he was already on the flank and in the rear of the enemy. A little later, these troops thought they heard his guns. But what if Jackson did not come up? How could the general plan be saved from ruin? How could McClellan be prevented from attacking on the south side or sending heavy reinforcements to the north side? Quickly Lee dictated an order to Huger, telling him to hold his trenches at the point of the bayonet, if need be, and advising him where he could get help if he required it. A cavalry demonstration on the extreme Confederate right beyond White Oak Swamp was also ordered as a means of ascertaining the enemy's strength and of keeping him from withdrawing troops to the Confederate left. As for Hill's battle, a direct assault on Beaver Dam Creek was out of the question. The strength of the federal position was only too well known to Lee and to the senior division commanders. They had never intended to give battle there. The only possible way of winning the position was to turn it. That was what Jackson was to do on the Confederate left, would he never come? If he did not, it was too late in the day to send another column there, even if the slow march of D. H. Hill and Longstreet from across the Chickahominy could be hastened. The only hope was to try the extreme right, where the ridge fell away toward the Chickahominy. The venture would be desperate, but there was no alternative. If Lee halted in front of the federal position, McClellan might attack on the south side of the Chickahominy the next morning or might reinforce his troops on Beaver Dam Creek overnight and oppose a large force to Jackson. If the federal right could be turned, the gain was obvious. If the attempt failed, McClellan might at least be kept from sending a heavy column to oppose Jackson. The decision was made more quickly than the reasoning that prompted it can be retraced. Pender's troops, in some confusion, were already far on the right. Ripley, who commanded the only brigade of D. H. Hill's division that had yet completed the crossing of the Chickahominy, was ordered to move still farther to the right and to turn the enemy's flank. Several messages were sent to hurry him forward, one of them by President Davis himself. Soon Ripley was up, soon he was moving forward. He did not know the ground, of course, and he took the exposed route over which Pender had already moved. Time was lost at the very outset. Casualties were sustained that might have been avoided. The roar of the artillery continued as twilight came on. The rattle of small arms from the valley of Beaver Dam Creek was ceaseless. Lee waited and hoped, but hoped in vain. For the ambulant wounded, limping back across the fire-swept field, brought news of the failure of Ripley's flank attack. The men of the 1st North Carolina and of the 44th Georgia were not led far enough to the right to get below the hill on the eastern side of the creek when the Federals were making their stand. Instead, the attacking column plunged down a hill, in the very face of the enemy, falling in windrows at every step. The few that reached the bottom found themselves within the easiest point-blank range of the Federal infantry. Those who escaped unhurt cheated death. Rhett's battery, coming up from the Chickahominy, took position within 1,200 yards of the Federal guns and somewhat reduced the enemy's fire, another battery added the weight of its metal, but it was in vain. Darkness settled, and the remnants of Ripley's and of Pender's men were called back from the tangle around the creek and were given such shelter as could be found a few hundred yards from it. By nine o'clock, the infantry action was over. The artillery duel continued for another hour and, on some parts of the line until even later. The regiment of Anderson's brigade that had succeeded in crossing the creek beyond the old church road on the Confederate left was withdrawn to the right bank of the stream. Lee's first battle was finished. Fought where he had not expected to be engaged, it had carried the Confederates no farther than the prepared position of the Federals, and there it had been a ghastly failure.
With 56,000 men north of the Chickahominy, or crossing it, Lee had been able to get only 14,000 into action and had lost nearly 10% of them, with no other gain than to drive the enemy from the plain around Mechanicsville. The federal loss could only be surmised, but from the nature of the action, it had to be regarded as trivial. And this was the result of days of hard planning and careful preparation. Where Lee had expected to turn Beaver Dam Creek and to sweep down the Chickahominy, with all the advantage of surprise, something had gone wrong with Jackson, and a P. Hill had been halted and bloodily repulsed. The plan, of course, was disclosed to McClellan now. The whole element of surprise was lost. The federal commander could reinforce his right or attack Richmond on his left. Lee could only hope that Jackson would turn the creek during the night so that the original battle plan could be carried out. Until 11 o'clock at night he worked to prepare the troops and to make the dispositions for an attack at dawn and then, wearily, he went back across the river to rest. A doubtful mind would have asked if the man who had failed at Cheat Mountain and failed at Sewell Mountain and failed at Mechanicsville had in him the stuff of which victory was made. If Lee had such misgivings that clean, starlit June night, he stifled them. It was his duty to go on, and he would. Chapter 13, Lee's First Victory, at Heavy Cost Gaines's Mill Two tasks Lee had on the morning of June 27, 1862. If his plan was not to fail utterly, he must drive the Federals from Beaver Dam Creek, where they found still there, and, secondly, he must pursue them down the north bank of the Chickahominy and either force them to fight away from the cover of their entrenchments and heavy guns or else compel them to retreat. The cloudless sky gave promise of a scorching day. Whatever else happened, rain was not apt to interrupt the army's movements. Giving orders for his heavy ordnance to move down the valley and to play from across the river on the line of the expected federal withdrawal, Lee snatched up a hasty breakfast and started for Mechanicsville, whence the sound of renewed infantry and artillery fire was already to be heard. Arriving at the village, while the shell were breaking there, he dispatched Major Walter Taylor to find Jackson and to show him his route, and then he quickly prepared to turn, from the north and from the south, the slaughter pen on Beaver Dam Creek. Before the turning movement could be organized, the Federals ceased fire and evacuated the position. Now for the pursuit and the new attack. Repairing quickly the bridge opposite Ellerson's mill, Maxi Gregg soon had his brigade across the stream and in a short time was moving uphill beyond the plain little grist mill that had won so unhappy a name from the battle fought over it on the 26th. The road of Hill's advance, which Gregg was to lead, ran eastward along the heights of the Chickahominy five and a half miles to Old Cold Harbor and then six miles and a half to Dispatch Station on the York River Railroad, McClellan's main line of supply. Nearer the Chickahominy, Wilcox, whose brigade was at the head of Longstreet's division, found a broken bridge and beyond it a track that crossed the flats and paralleled the Old Cold Harbor Road eastward for three miles. North of the routes by which Longstreet and A.P. Hill were to travel, there were two others by which Jackson and D.H. Hill could advance until they were within two and a half miles of Old Cold Harbor. Then they might have to follow the same road. If all went as planned, therefore, the four columns could each move on the heels of the enemy toward the York River Railroad. By nine o'clock, A.P. Hill and Longstreet were well underway. D. H. Hill had with him a young lieutenant who had been reared in that vicinity and knew every bypath, but some of Hill's brigadiers and all the commanding officers of Jackson's column were embarrassed from the outset by a lack of competent guides. The maps issued officers proved unworthy of the name and showed no details of the ground north of the Chickahominy. The route of each division was indicated by a red line which unhappy experience was soon to show the Confederates did not correspond even approximately to the roads they were to follow. The reproduction will illustrate the crudities of the map. Waiting near Mechanicsville until the last brigade of Longstreet's division was moving, Lee followed the line of march of that command, crossed the lower bridge, picking his way carefully through the ranks, and soon was on ground where burning stores and abandoned supplies evidenced the rapidity of the federal withdrawal. He had not gone far before he found that contact with the enemy had already been established. In the Peach Orchard of Fairfield, the home of William Gaines, about a mile eastward, a battery of Federal artillery was blazing away. Hill's advance had brushed the rear guard of the enemy and, what was equally exciting, had been fired upon by Jackson's artillery. For Jackson was at last on the ground and the head of his column was near Walnut Grove Church, about two miles east of Ellerson's Mill, where his route touched a P. Hill's.
to that little wayside Churchley Road and found Jackson talking to a P. Hill. After a few minutes, Hill withdrew, and Lee sat down on a cedar stump to confer with the redoubtable commander of the Valley Army. It was the first time many of Lee's staff officers had been close to Jackson and they were curious to see the man who had dazzled the Confederacy by his victories at Cross Keys and Port Republic less than three weeks before. Equally curious were Jackson's aides to have a glimpse of their new general-in-chief. There is no record of what passed between Jackson and Lee. If Jackson made any explanation, it doubtless was to say that on his march he had enjoyed none of the anticipated advantages of a surprise. On the contrary, the Federals had acted precisely as if they had been expecting them, as, indeed, they had. After leaving Lee on the evening of the 23rd, Jackson had rejoined his command on the 24th. Its march had been slow and difficult on account of mud, heat, and high water. On the 25th, part of the army had moved only five miles. Instead of reaching the Central Railroad on the evening of June 25, Jackson had scarcely made Ashland. He had moved his first division at 3 a.m. on the morning of the 26th, but many of his men were unaccustomed to marching in a low country along sandy byways. The officers knew nothing of the roads. His progress had been so slow that it had been nine o'clock before he had crossed the Virginia Central Railroad. He had at once notified General Branch of that fact. Not until three o'clock had he reached the Totopotomoy Creek, approximately four and one-half miles from the railroad. At that point, he had found that the Federal pickets had partially destroyed the bridge. Skirmishers had been sent across and Riley's battery had shelled the woods. It was the smoke of this fire that had been observed from the south side of the Chickahominy just about the time a P. Hill started from the meadow bridges. The engineers having quickly repaired the crossing of the Totopotomoy, Jackson's advance had continued. There had been some alarms and rumors of impending attacks by the enemy. A few obstructions had been encountered in the road. The troops, tired and nervous, had groped their way forward. Jackson had continued his advance to Pole Green Church, as his orders had directed, and had gone a little farther to Hundley's Corner, where Ewell's division, which had been moving by roads nearer the railroad, had rejoined the main column. It had then been 4.30 p.m. The sound of a P. Hill's battle had been audible, and the sun had still been nearly three hours high, but there Jackson had halted, and there he had bivouacked, molested only by a few Federal skirmishers who had been driven back after sundown with little difficulty. At least one of Jackson's brigade commanders had thought Jackson should have continued his march, but Jackson had not asked or received counsel from his subordinates. On the morning of the 27th, some of Jackson's units had moved early, but others had not been aroused by their officers when the firing had been resumed in front of Mechanicsville. The march to Walnut Grove Church had been but little interrupted by the enemy, and here Jackson was. He considered that he had discharged the first part of his mission, as far as the conditions permitted, and he made no apologies for halting at Hundley's Corner. Lee, for his part, appears to have raised no question, he simply told Jackson to hasten his march on Cold Harbor. As D. H. Hill was to continue in support, Jackson would have under his command considerably more than half that part of the army on the north side of the river. His advance would turn Powai Creek, the only nearby stream on which it was believed that the Federals could make a stand while maintaining direct contact with their forces south of the Chickahominy. If this movement did not itself force a federal retreat, it would put Jackson on the line of the federal communications with the York River Railroad and in position to fall on the Unionists when a P. Hill and Longstreet drove them. The interview over, Jackson rejoined his command, and Lee rode on to the head of Hill's column, which he instructed to press forward and to attack the enemy as soon as located. Then Lee turned into the lane that led to Selwyn, the home of William Hogan, set in a fine grove of trees overlooking the Chickahominy. It was now about noon, and so far as the situation was known to Lee, it was altogether favorable. For just east of the Hogan House was the military road that led down to New Bridge, Lee's intermediate objective. This crossing had been partially destroyed by the retreating Federals, but under orders that Lee immediately issued, it could be reopened at nightfall. Then Lee would be in close touch with Magruder and could quickly reinforce the South Side in case McClellan attacked there. The most serious danger in Lee's plan of campaign seemed to be safely overcome.
Besides, A. P. Hill and Longstreet were advancing rapidly, and if Jackson and D. H. Hill did equally well, it could not be long before the battle was joined, with every promise of success. Longstreet and A. P. Hill soon rode up to the Hogan House, and news began to come in that indicated the proximity of the Federals. From across the river, General W. N. Pendleton, chief of the reserve artillery, sent word that he could see the enemy in great force east of Powhite, Dr. Gaines's house, which occupied a knoll, three-quarters of a mile down the Chickahominy from Selwyn. The topography of the country made it probable that the Federals would give battle there. Between Dr. Gaines's plantation and the reported position of the enemy was the watercourse known as Powhite Creek. On the Confederate maps this appeared as a straight stream flowing from the north into the Chickahominy. Almost directly opposite the mouth of this creek were the Federal lines on the south side of the river. It seemed altogether probable that the Federals held a continuous front, north and south, along Powhite Creek to the Chickahominy and thence across that stream and were awaiting attack there. Lee proceeded to make his first plan of the day in the expectation that the battle would be fought on Powhite Creek. Huger was advised of the state of affairs and was urged if the Federals showed any disposition to abandon their front on the south side, to press them hard. Pendleton was told to employ against the Federals the long-range guns that Lee had ordered into action early in the morning and had subsequently directed to cease firing lest they interfere with the pursuit. As Jackson and D. H. Hill were marching toward the Federal rear, turning Powhite Creek, a sharp attack would force the Federals from that stream and would throw them into the very mouth of Jackson's artillery. A. P. Hill was directed to assault as soon as possible, with his full strength. Longstreet's division, which was still coming up, was to be placed in reserve to support Hill in rear and on the right. The plan, in graphic terms, is shown on the opposite page. Meantime, about 11 o'clock, D. H. Hill had arrived at Old Cold Harbor, whence led the road to dispatch station. He had found the enemy in strength across another road that linked Old Cold Harbor with Grapevine Bridge over the Chickahominy, and about noon, he had attacked hotly along the upper stretch of a little stream that ran from east to west. Lee heard nothing and knew nothing of D. H. Hill's affair to the eastward, though he had sent staff officers to hasten Jackson's advance. The first intimation that Lee had that the infantry had come together was the sound of rapid volleys about 1 p.m. from the Cold Harbor Road on which A. P. Hill was advancing to the eastward. Riding thither, Lee found that Maxie Gregg's South Carolina Brigade had reached the point where the Cold Harbor Road crossed Powhite Creek at Gaines's Mill. The ground there was somewhat similar to that at Ellerson's Mill, and the enemy was perched on the hill east of Powhite Creek to dispute that passage. Gregg, however, moving rapidly, crossed with slight difficulty about 1.30 p.m. and was soon in pursuit of the enemy. This was a suspiciously easy beginning if the Federals had really intended to make a stand on Powhite Creek, as Lee had supposed. Why did not the enemy contest the crossing? Why was no artillery in position? Passing uphill from the creek, Lee came to an open plateau, with crops under cultivation and small woods on the horizon. There was no sign of a Federal line of battle to the east, but there was firing from the south and southeast. Bullets began to fall about Lee. His staff officers suggested that he retire out of range. Instead, he pushed onto a point where Marmaduke Johnson's battery was awaiting orders. At that moment, from a stretch of woods to the southeast, in the vicinity of what was known at New Cold Harbor, some of Gregg's troops began to roll back. Not knowing what had happened, Lee ordered Johnson to unlimber and to prepare to meet an attack. Gentlemen, he said to his staff and to the officers of the battery, we must rally those men. He spurred his horse into a gallop and soon was in the midst of the fleeing infantry, calling on them to stop and for the honor of their state to go back and meet the enemy. The panic was local and short-lived. Greg himself was on the scene in a few minutes and led his men quickly and steadily back into the woods. Soon the fighting there was as hot as before. The enemy was at bay, and not, as Lee had supposed, on a line running north and south, but more nearly on a front extending from east to west, curving widely to the north like the outer side of a drawn bow. Such reconnaissance as was possible under the heavy and increasing fire of the Federals showed the terrain falling away on the south and southeast into a wooded, boggy bottom, through which ran a sluggish little stream known as Boson Swamp. This watercourse was not on Lee's map, and its presence explained why McClellan had not stood on Powhite Creek.
The position selected by the Federals was stronger and more compact than a North and South Front would have been. Rising on the south of Boson Swamp was a long hill, with steep grades facing the north and the west. In rear of this hill, the ground sloped off to the wide flats of the Chickahominy. This, then, evidently was the main Federal position, and the approaches to it were bad. There were only two roads, both narrow. One of them ran straight downgrade from New Cold Harbor to the swamp and thence due south to the home of Mrs. Watt on the crest of the hill. The other road started at almost the same point, went southeast across the swamp and up the hill and then followed the crest eastward, past the McGee House, to the highway from Old Cold Harbor to Grapevine Bridge. Except on these two roads, which ran for part of the distance through a thick, high growth and crowding underbrush, the only line of attack was across the fields and through the wooded swamp. It was a terrible position to have to assault. Of the ground on the left, where Jackson was to take position, Lee could see nothing. The heavy thick intervening forest along the McGee House Road effectually cut off vision. So far as Lee could ascertain, the general topography was as shown on page 145. The prisoners taken at Mechanicsville and the stragglers picked up along the road all belonged only to Fitz John Porter's V Provisional Corps, but the volume of fire and the calmness of the Federals in taking position and awaiting attack convinced Lee that the greater part of McClellan's army was in his front. In that case, Lee reasoned that they would extend their flank to meet him, as otherwise Jackson would be between them and their base. As Jackson's arrival on the Confederate left was momentarily expected, the Federals were likely to start their shift to the right at any time. If, therefore, Hill engaged them now and Longstreet waited with his fresh troops till the enemy began to move, there was every reason to hope that McClellan, in making for the roads to dispatch station, would be trapped by Jackson, as shown on the opposite page. A. P. Hill made his dispositions with speed. Waiting only long enough to see that Longstreet was coming into position, Hill ordered his men forward at 2.30 p.m. on a front of three and a half brigades from the woods that fringed the south side of the Gaines's Millcold Harbor Road. Most of Hill's troops had never been in action until the previous day, but they did not seem shaken by the reverse at Mechanicsville. In front of Hill's right, west of the road to the Watt Farm, was a cleared field surrounding the Parsons' house, which had a fenced-in garden. To the south of the house was a small orchard on the brow of the ridge overlooking Boson's swamp. On the left and center of Hill's line of advance, open ground led into a wood that ran down to the swamp and beyond it. At the word of command, Hill's right brigades moved across the field past the Parsons' house and to the brow of the ridge. Then the Federal artillery from the other side of Boson's swamp opened on them a devastating fire of shrapnel. Men began to fall fast, but the lines swept on and disappeared from Lee's sight as they plunged downward toward the swamp. A moment more and there came the crash of an overwhelming Federal volley, delivered at 500 yards. Right and left the fire swelled along the swamp and echoed against the ridges with a roar that men who were to pass through many battles never forgot to the end of their days. Hill had put three batteries into service to cover the advance, but though they were well served, only Crenshaw's on the left gave any real protection to the attacking force. It was oppressively hot in the glare of the full afternoon sun. The smoke hung over the hill so heavily that Lee could only judge of the progress of the action by the sound of the firing. On the left, Gregg evidently was advancing. In the center and on the right, as well as they could be distinguished, the Confederate volleys for a while seemed farther away, then they remained stationary for a time, then they were closer. And soon, with a sinking of heart, observers on the fringe of the wood saw men struggling back over the shell-swept crest. Some were running in panic, some were attempting to hold their formation, others were rallying under their officers and were forming where the grade afforded shelter. In a few moments, the fugitives were back in the woods fronting the Cold Harbor Road. They had a dreadful tale to tell. When they had descended from the ridge, they had found themselves in thick underbrush along the swamp. At some points the swamp was a deep ravine out of which a man could hardly climb, elsewhere it was sixty feet across, with the stream completely lost in bog, farther down it was a mere ditch, over which a soldier could leap. Behind the ditch, or in the swamp, the Federals had a line, and beyond that a second, at some points close to the swamp and at others, halfway up the hill. As far as different men had been able to see this second line, it had consisted of felled timber, of knapsacks against fences, of piled logs, of anything that would stop bullets and give shelter.
On the crest of the hill, there seemed to be massed reserves or a third line, with an abundance of artillery. Archer had come within twenty paces of the first line and had been compelled to fall back. J. R. Anderson had made three charges, and one of his regiments had penetrated the line, but when his center had wavered, he had retreated, and in doing so had confused Field's brigade, which was supporting him. Two of Pender's regiments had likewise entered the Federal lines, but had been beaten back. Branch's command had been confused. Only Gregg had succeeded in crossing the swamp on the left, where the woods ran well up the flank of Turkey Hill, and there he remained. Some of the units were rallying, even as the others withdrew, and were now pressing a forlorn, second assault, but it was now nearly four o'clock and there was no denying the fact that a P. Hill had sustained a costly repulse. From the sound of the firing in the swamp, it was believed that the Federals had themselves taken the offensive. This of itself was convincing evidence that there had been no weakening of the Federal left to meet the long-expected movement of Jackson on the right. Lee had, therefore, to scrap his previous plan of action and to arrange for a general assault all along the line as soon as the troops could be put in position. Thus far, only a P. Hill had attacked. If he exhausted himself in futile affrays, there was danger that the tragedy of the 26th would be repeated and that victory would be lost because the whole army could not be thrown into action simultaneously. If, again, Hill were now attacked, his shattered division could not stand help must be had at once. Lee kept sending messengers to Jackson, urging him to hurry forward, so that the general assault could be delivered, but as immediate assistance could only be assured on the right, Lee dispatched orders to Longstreet to make a diversion in Hill's favor. Before Longstreet moved, perhaps before he received Lee's message, Jackson's doughty and eccentric lieutenant, General R. S. Ewell, came down the road from Old Cold Harbor and reported. His division was immediately behind him, he said, Whiting's two brigades and Lawton's Georgians were not far away. D. H. Hill was engaged on the federal right, Ewell said, and Jackson's own division, after having been delayed in reaching Old Cold Harbor by taking the wrong road, was coming up. Lee at once ordered Ewell to support A. P. Hill on the right of the road leading to the McGee House and directed him to send back officers to quicken the march of Whiting and Lawton. As Ewell prepared to throw in two brigades on the ground where a P. Hill's left had been fighting, Longstreet started a demonstration with four of his brigades, and the second phase of the battle began on a wider front. Jackson, it now developed, had reached Old Cold Harbor ahead of his division, which had marched very slowly. He had found D. H. Hill engaged hotly with the enemy on the upper stretches of Boson Swamp, with his line drawn east and west, to the left of a P. Hill, but not in contact with him. Jackson knew little of the ground or of the disposition of the Union forces. Expecting that a P. Hill and Longstreet would drive the enemy across his front, from west to east, in accordance with Lee's first plan, Jackson had become apprehensive that the Confederate attacking force would confuse his own men with the Federals. For that reason, Jackson had ordered D. H. Hill to break off the action and to take a position that would put open ground in front of him. He had not been in that position long, however, before the sound of the firing on the Confederate right gave proof that a P. Hill was being hard-pressed and was facing south. Jackson consequently had ordered D. H. Hill to change front again and he now directed him to advance against the enemy. Jackson's own brigades, unacquainted with the country, were drifting badly. Some of D. H. Hill's units became confused in reaching their position, and by no means all of them were ready when Ewell went forward on their right, but those who could be brought up emerged from the woods that sheltered them on the western side of the Cold Harbor Grapevine Bridge Road and crossed an open field that led downgrade to a belt of heavy timber. Making their way over the stream, which here was little more than a brook, they reached the southern edge of the woods, where the Federals had felled some timber. Beyond them stretched upward, for four hundred yards, a wide field of young corn. Then came the first Union line, held by the regular infantry of Sykes's division, protected in part by the irregularities of the ground and in part by a fence, and supported by excellent artillery. Well in rear of this line, and so washed and sunken at points as to afford admirable shelter, was the road that ran across the crest of the eastern side of the hill past the McGee House to the Cold Harbor Grapevine Bridge Highway. The McGee House itself was south of the road along the crest and was set on commanding ground, surrounded by fences, outbuildings, and an orchard. East of that large property, beyond the Cold Harbor Grapevine Bridge Road, there was a copse near the Confederate front, then open ground and a tangle of small, second-growth pine. 
D.H. Hill's progress to the southern end of the woods along the upper waters of Boson's swamp had been easy, but beyond that point his every attack was met with a quick counterthrust. At length, when Garland's and G.B. Anderson's brigades found their progress halted by the fire of a battery near the McGee House, Hill ordered the artillery stormed by a separate column, the 20th North Carolina, while Garland and Anderson assaulted the infantry. The guns were taken and retaken, but the two brigades meantime reached the road on the crest in front of the McGee House and found shelter there. D. H. Hill was not so close to victory at this point as he subsequently thought, but he was in position to cooperate effectively if a general assault was ordered. Jackson, meantime, was busily employed in bringing up his own division and in arranging artillery support for D. H. Hill from guns that had been delayed on the road. As the battle roared toward its climax, Jackson's spirits rose. Sending officers to all his division commanders, he said, tell them that this affair must hang in suspense no longer, sweep the field with the bayonet. When all were on the march to their positions, he rode over toward New Cold Harbor to report to Lee. By this time Trimble's and Richard Taylor's brigades of Ewell's divisions were feeling the strength of the federal center Ewell's left was not in contact with D. H. Hill nor his right with A. P. Hill. Taylor's brigade was driven off the field, and Gregg's men, who had advanced across the swamp in Hill's major charge, were being forced slowly back. Trimble fared better. His regiments extended their flanks and contrived to keep up a vigorous fire until reinforced a little later by the 5th Texas and a part of Hampton's Legion. One private in Trimble's command, finding a loose horse, mounted and rode up and down the ranks at a critical moment, rallying the men, who took him to be an officer of rank. Beyond Ewell's front, a P. Hill's survivors were holding on to the crest in front of the Parsons' house, facing a fire that was, if anything, stronger than ever. Still farther to the right, Longstreet's demonstration was taking form. Except for his skirmishers, Longstreet had kept his men under the shelter offered by a hill and a small wood during Hill's first attack. Pickett's brigade was on his left, next day, P. Hill and three other brigades, temporarily under Wilcox, were in line on Longstreet's right. As they now began to deploy, they found themselves on difficult ground. A plain, one quarter mile or more in depth, part of it in wheat, stretched from the eastern bank of Poway Creek to Boson's Swamp. The edge of Boson's Swamp was deeply scarped, dammed on its lower stretch, and covered by a belt of partially felled timber much less thick than farther upstream. Where the swamp turned from west to south, into the valley of the Chickahominy, the timber gave way to open fields. Across these fields from the hill occupied by the Federals, and from the heights of the south side of the Chickahominy, there was breaking a crossfire of shell which no troops could endure. Behind the eastern side of Boson's swamp, on the flank of the hill, were Federal sharpshooters, above them a line of infantry behind felled trees, and at an elevation of about 40 feet above the second line, the Federal artillery and reserves were well covered. No sooner did the demonstration disclose the strength of the position in his front than Longstreet saw that a diversion would simply be a waste of life. He could only help a P. Hill by converting the demonstration into an assault and he accordingly paused to bring up troops for that purpose. Such was the situation after 5 p.m., Longstreet preparing for a general assault on the right, a. P. Hill's men on the right center, delivering a desultory fire, Ewell fighting on the center with both flanks in the air, Jackson's diversion, Whiting, and Lawton coming up to plug the holes in the line, D. H. Hill in a favorable position but still encountering stiff resistance, the Federals unshaken and reinforced, their powerful artillery firing fast. If the battle was to be saved, the full weight of the Confederate army must be thrown against the enemy. No time must be lost in hurling Jackson's unemployed troops into the struggle. At the end of the first phase of the battle, when A.P. Hill had been almost worn out, Ewell had come to his rescue, and now, with the issue still in doubt, down the same road from Old Cold Harbor Road Jackson, dust-covered, with his dingy cadet cap pulled down over his weak eyes, sitting awkwardly on an ugly horse, and sucking a lemon. Lee went up and greeted him. Ah, General, said he, I am very glad to see you. I had hoped to be with you before, which was a tactful way of saying he had hoped Jackson would have arrived earlier. Jackson nodded his head quickly and made some brief reply, unintelligible in the deafening din from the woods to the south of them. That fire is very heavy, Lee said. Do you think your men can stand it? Listening a moment, Jackson answered bluntly, they can stand almost anything. They can stand that.
After a brief conference on the proper disposition of the troops not yet in line, Jackson rode away. Meantime Lawton, with his 3,500 Georgians, the largest brigade in the army, had joined Ewell without reporting to Lee and was making his fire felt. Soon Lee saw up the road his brilliant assistant of Sollers Point, General W. H. C. Whiting, who had been feeling his way to the right from Old Cold Harbor, where the various commands of Jackson's column had been much confused. Lee at once ordered Whiting to support A. P. Hill's right, just as Ewell had been thrown in to relieve A. P. Hill's left. Ere long the head of Whiting's division was in the road. Lee rode toward it and inquired for General John B. Hood, leading the Texas Brigade of that command. Hood came up on his horse and saluted. Briefly Lee told him what had happened, how the troops on the front were fighting gallantly but had not been able to dislodge the enemy. This must be done, he said quietly. Can you break his line? I will try, answered Hood, stoutly enough. As Lee turned his horse's head to ride away, he lifted his hat. May God be with you, he said. It would take time for Hood and Law, who commanded Whiting's other brigade, to pass down the road and deploy for action. Meantime, Gregg's men were leaving the swamp, and from the center and right of A. P. Hill's division, more weary soldiers were seeking the rear. Whiting would help, but Longstreet must not delay. Unless he acted speedily, the day might be lost. Lee hurried a staff officer to Longstreet to tell him so. Anxiously, he waited. Louder and louder the battle roared through a half-hour of uncertainty as the shadows lengthened and twilight began to settle where the woods were thickest. Then, from beyond the parson's house came a strange, shrill, sustained cry, as if thousands of men were calling on the dogs in a fox hunt. It was the rebel yell. Whiting's men were going into action. They had established contact with Longstreet, and his brigades also were pressing forward. From his position, Lee could not see what had happened next, but it was a drama that gave Hood's Texans a place in his heart that no other command ever won. E. M. Law's brigade was on the right, next picket, who held Longstreet's left. Hood was on the left of Law. Whiting's orders were that his two brigades should advance in a double line, straight for the edge of the ridge where Hill's men still hung on. Then they were to start the double-quick, trailing arms, and were not to fire a shot. As they went forward, Hood saw a gap in an open field between Law and Pickett and he quickly moved the 4th Texas across Law's rear and into this gap. The movement was flawless, the whole division swept onward, the 4th Texas ahead of the others. The fire grew faster. So did the pace of the men. By the hundred they fell, but without a break in the alignment. They were passing through Hill's ranks, they were plunging down the grade into the swamp. A thousand had fallen now, but scarcely a musket had been fired from the attacking division. The men were within twenty yards of the Federal front line, within ten, and then, suddenly, as if the same fear had seized every heart, the Federals were leaving their works, were running, were throwing their arms away. Over the second line they swarmed, spreading panic. Through swamp, in pursuit, the Texans crashed, up the hill and over the second line they rushed, and then, as the bluecoats spread in a confused mass, the Confederates loosed their volley where every bullet reached its mark. A break had been made. If it could be widened, the enemy would be routed. The hands on Lee's watch were pointing to seven o'clock. The sun was below the forest on the other side of the Chickahominy. Lee had in line every man he could hope to place there. It was time for the final thrust. Before he knew the full measure of success that had attended Whiting's assault, he gave orders to A. P. Hill to start a general advance and to communicate the word to right and to left. It was scarcely necessary. The orders given at intervals during the afternoon, the hard riding of the staff officers, and the steady marching of thousands of boys had not been in vain. Longstreet's columns were moving, Lawton had not halted since his brigade had gone into action, Ewell was full of fight, cheering for the Georgians, everyone knew that Jackson had arrived, D. H. Hill had seen his opportunity, and his regiments had rushed for the McGee House about the time the Texans had broken through the swamp. In fifteen minutes, as if some animated jigsaw puzzle had suddenly fallen into place, the full design of the assault showed itself.
Through fast-gathering twilight, the Federals yielded slowly and stubbornly in front of the Confederate left, gave ground rapidly in the center, and on the right, where Whiting had made lodgment, broke wildly, carrying their support with them. A reckless cavalry charge by part of Lee's old regiment and fragments of other units confused the Federal artillery. Fourteen fine guns, fall from firing, some of the very pieces that had balked the Confederates the previous day at Ellerson's Mill, were captured after a gallant defense. One brave cannoneer, desperately wounded, dragged himself up by the spokes of a wheel, pulled the lanyard and fired into the very faces of the charging Confederates. A battery on the road to the Wood House discharged a round of double canister into the attacking column at point-blank range and in the confusion managed to limber up and escape. Two Union regiments were taken on Whiting's front and large detachments everywhere. Small groups of brave men held out here and there, the reserve artillery got away, Sykes's regulars kept their formation, as became their traditions. Cheers rose from the Federal right as the defeated troops met reinforcements. Elsewhere, as darkness settled, the Union troops made for the Chickahominy Flats south of the hill, where it was futile to attempt to pursue them. Lee had won his first victory and promptly dispatched to the president a message in which he prefaced announcement to that effect with the characteristic phrase, profoundly grateful to Almighty God. But it was a heavy price he had paid. There had been, Longstreet said, more feats of individual valor than he had seen on any field. The slaughter of officers had been tremendous. The list of the fallen read like a roster of the Southern aristocracy. The 1st Texas had lost nearly 600 of its 800. The 4th Texas had seen all its field officers killed or wounded and had finished the battle under the command of a captain. Its casualties had numbered 252. The total Confederate dead and wounded, though never separately tabulated, could not have fallen below 8,000, and in some brigades the slain were so numerous that 24 hours scarcely sufficed to bury them. And there might be a like butcher's bill on the morrow. Nor had the Confederates on the south side of the Chickahominy escaped casualties. Knowing the impetuosity of his army, Lee had apprehended that Magruder's men might not be willing to sit quietly behind their fortifications and see their comrades across the river winning glory at the cannon's mouth. He consequently had taken the precaution in mid-afternoon to order Magruder not to take the initiative except when certain of success and when acting in cooperation with the forces north of the Chickahominy. Through some misunderstanding, however, a reconnaissance had been converted into an attack by General Toombs and some 400 men had been lost in a clumsy and futile operation at Golding's Farm. Lee got the unhappy details late in the evening, but had little time to ponder them. To plan for the next move, Lee now rode back to Selwyn, the Hogan House, where he conferred with Jackson and Longstreet. It was a night of groaning and of misery for the thousands of wounded, a night of sorrow and of expectancy for the man who issued late orders to his lieutenants and then gave humble thanks to the god of battles that the grip of the enemy on Richmond had been loosened. Chapter 14 A Cloud by Day Breakfast for General Lee on the morning of June 28 was a matter of snatching up a bit of ham and bread, which he ate as he rode rapidly from the Hogan House at daylight to renew the action. When he reached the battlefield, the ambulance detachments were still at work bringing in a multitude of boys, bloody and prostrate, who had spent an age-long night of misery under the stars. Longstreet's advanced guard was making its way cautiously through the half-light across the hill to locate the enemy. On the left, Jackson was moving in the same way over the fields and down the road toward Grapevine Bridge. Soon the couriers began to gallop back to Lee, all of them with the same message, the enemy was gone from the north side of the Chickahominy. Jackson's men had met a cavalry detachment, but it had fled at the first fire of the skirmishers. Many prisoners had been taken, among them Lee's opponent in western Virginia, Brigadier General John F. Reynolds, who had slept too long in the woods. Longstreet found only the dead, the wounded, and the straggling in his front. The bridges over the Chickahominy, built with so much skill and patient labor, had all been burned. The enemy appeared to be concentrating on the south side of the river and apparently had evacuated none of his positions there. All the approaches to the destroyed crossings were under the fire of massed artillery, as if the enemy were prepared to contest pursuit. In effect, the right bank of the river, east of New Bridge, had been made a fortress. <laughs>
At the same time, it seemed scarcely conceivable that McClellan, after only one general engagement, had abandoned the railroad by which daily he had been receiving for his great army 600 tons of supplies. He must be preparing to renew the battle, somewhere, for the defense of his line of communications, which, it will be remembered, traversed the Chickahominy at dispatch station, six miles downstream from the battlefield, and ran thence twelve miles northeastward to the White House thus. Obviously, if Lee held to his original plan of campaign and destroyed the Federal's rail communications, he would force the enemy to retreat, to change base, or to fight while he subsisted his men with such supplies as were on hand or could be brought up by narrow, threatened roads. Any one of the three courses offered immediate opportunity to Lee. Calling a nearby cavalryman, Lee sent him galloping off to find General Stewart, and when Stewart arrived, Lee directed him to move down the Chickahominy, to destroy the railroad, and to get on McClellan's supply line. Ewell's division was likewise ordered to march in support, on a similar mission, preceded by one regiment of cavalry. General Longstreet was told to bring up such long-range guns as he could collect and to open on the enemy across the river from his position. This was all that could be done at the time. The river stopped reconnaissance, the Federal fire made the rebuilding of the bridges impossible, Magruder could not even feel out the lines in his front because they were protected by heavy earthworks, felled timber, swamps and woods, and formed an impenetrable screen. While awaiting developments, Lee rode over part of the ground of the previous day's action, working his way toward the left, looking all the while for the Rockbridge artillery with which his youngest son was serving as a private. He had heard that the battery had followed Jackson, he did not know whether Robert was dead or alive. Finally, in front of the McGee house, he found the battery, which had not been engaged in the action of the 27th. A crowd gathered after Lee halted, but Robert was not in it. Search discovered him so soundly asleep under a caisson that calls did not arouse him. Only a vigorous prodding with a sponge staff in the hands of a zealous comrade brought him out, at last, half-dazed. He was well and unscathed, though much the worse for dust and hard marching. Greetings exchanged, Lee rode away, and nobody seemed to think it in any way odd that the son of the commanding general should be serving in the ranks. Everywhere that Lee moved that morning officers were afield. The men were strolling about or sleeping, the ambulance detachments continued to take away the wounded, and the burial squads were at their grim labor. Jackson had ridden over from the left to examine the ground of Whiting's advance. He seemed fresh and brisk enough, though he had been conferring with Stuart long after midnight, and as he examined the obstacles that Hood's Texans had surmounted in their incredible charge, his admiration overcame his reserve. The men who carried this position were soldiers indeed, he said. It was the first battlefield many of the troops had ever seen. In the enforced halt of the army, after the mad fury of the previous day, its ghastly stillness bewildered them. As often as they surveyed the bloody battleground, Lee's eyes turned anxiously to the opposite side of the river, where Longstreet's fire had apparently made no impression on the Federals. What was the enemy doing behind those trees that covered the hills above the Chickahominy? How long must the hours of opportunity slip past before Lee would know what move to make? Would McClellan thrust at Richmond? Was he resting and awaiting another attack? Did the woods conceal a retreat? The sun was high and very hot by now, and even where the shade was deep, the roads were drying fast. Ere noon had come, Trimble, of Ewell's division, reported that one of his officers had climbed a tree and had seen the enemy moving southward. Soon the bright panorama beyond the river valley began to be obscured. An ever-lengthening cloud began to rise over the treetops in the calm summer air. It was not the smoke of a silent battle, it was dust, and it could only have been raised by a vast column of laboring horses and marching men. Now there came distant flashes, echoing heavy explosions. Clouds of sulfurous smoke mounted like incense. Magazines were being fired. McClellan was on the move, but why and whither? From youngest recruit to commanding general, the Army of Northern Virginia watched and speculated. The dust cloud lengthened toward the horizon, the explosions multiplied, the smoke of fires spread more widely. A retreat, jubilant men exclaimed, a ruse, the pessimistic whiting contended.
Now a dusty, sweating courier on a frothing horse brought a message from Stuart, his cavalry had ridden fast and furiously, they had reached dispatch station, had cut the telegraph line to the White House, and had torn up a section of the track of the York River Railroad. A force of the enemy had been encountered. It had been compelled to hurry off down the Chickahominy toward Bottoms Bridge. Before doing so, here was what Stuart most desired General Lee to know, it had burned the railroad trestle across the river. As a later message from Trimble confirmed his earlier report that the enemy was moving southward, there was no misreading the great news, McClellan was so hard hit or so frightened that he was abandoning his base at the White House. He must be doing one of two things, either he was returning down the peninsula by the way he had come, or else he was changing base to the James River, where the federal sea power would suffice to refit and revictual him. But which? A retreat down the peninsula would be an admission of defeat, certain ruin for McClellan's prestige, and a blow to the morale of the North. Militarily easy, it would otherwise be costly. Was McClellan then, attempting to open a new line of communications from James River while holding his lines close to Richmond? Lee was disposed to believe that McClellan would do this rather than endure the humiliation of a retreat down the peninsula, but the stake was so large and the uncertainty so great that Lee was unwilling to launch a decisive maneuver on nothing more substantial than a personal opinion. If McClellan was establishing a base on the James, the whole of the Army of Northern Virginia should of course be concentrated on the south side of the Chickahominy and should be hurled against the enemy while he was in the confusion of change. But if the federal commander was preparing to retreat down the peninsula, there was a compelling reason for keeping a large part of the army north of the Chickahominy, the course of the stream was nearly east and west in front of Lee's position, but below that point the river bent more to the southeast and then ran almost south. McClellan was thus in an angle of the Chickahominy, and he could not move down the peninsula without crossing the river at some of the numerous wagon bridges below dispatch station. Were Lee to hurry to the south side in pursuit, McClellan could rapidly move eastward and could put the Chickahominy between him and the Army of Northern Virginia. By crossing once, in pursuit, Lee would have to pass the river again and probably would have to make the second crossing in the face of opposition, perhaps at heavy loss and with considerable delay. By remaining north of the river, Lee had only to march downstream to turn any position McClellan might be disposed to take on the left bank of the Chickahominy, preliminary to a withdrawal down the peninsula. Risk and probability seemed balanced. As far down the horizon as the dust clouds could be observed, they rose from roads that McClellan would follow whether he was moving his wagon train eastward down the peninsula or southward toward the James. Not a sign was there of any diminution of strength opposite Lee's own front or opposite that of Magruder and Huger. It was just such a situation as often paralyzes the initiative in pursuit. All that Lee felt he could safely do was to watch and guard the downstream bridges of the Chickahominy, to which McClellan would soon be coming if he were moving eastward. Ewell was ordered along the Chickahominy from dispatch station to Bottoms Bridge. The cavalry was sent to observe the lower crossings. Through the long, hot afternoon, Lee waited for further news from Ewell and from Stuart. Neither reported any activity down the river that suggested the approach of the enemy to the Chickahominy bridges. This silence strengthened Lee's belief that the enemy's objective was the James. He began to shape his plans for a pursuit on the morning of the 29th. In the hope of getting early information of an evacuation of the enemy's works on the south side, he directed that two of General Longstreet's engineers attempt to cross the Chickahominy during the night and make reconnaissance at close range. When General Pendleton arrived with a message from the president during the evening, Lee directed him to return to Magruder's headquarters and to urge the utmost vigilance on the part of that officer's outposts during the night. A little later he reiterated this in a direct message to Magruder, who was exceedingly nervous and apprehensive of an attack on his front. Thus ended a day that might have changed the whole course of the war if its ample hours of light could have been given to a march on the heels of the enemy. With his orders issued and his plan matured in large part, Lee transferred his headquarters to Dr. Gaines's house so that he could communicate instantly with Longstreet, who was already established there. By eleven o'clock Lee was in bed and asleep. Chapter 15 The Pursuit Goes Astray Savage Station Soon after sunrise on the morning of June 29, Lee received a message of great import from Major R. K. Meade and Lt. S. R. Johnston, the two engineers who had been sent from Longstreet's division to attempt a reconnaissance across the Chickahominy.
They had succeeded in making their way over the swamp, and their reports sent a thrill through the army, the great, frowning federal works around Golding's farm were empty. This was the key position south of the Chickahominy. If McClellan had evacuated Golding's farm, it could only mean one thing, he had abandoned his attempt to take Richmond. Lee's spirits rose at the news. What fairer opportunity could any soldier ask than to attack his adversary in retreat and while changing base? The aim of the campaign had been to force McClellan to retire or to come out from behind his entrenchments so that he could be attacked to advantage. McClellan obligingly had done both. In the midst of the first exhilaration an officer arrived from the south side with the news that Magruder was preparing to attack. The theatrical tone of the announcement aroused Lee's sense of humor. He sent the officer back with his compliments to the general and with the facetious request that in making his assault, Magruder should take care not to injure Major Meade and Lieutenant Johnston, who already occupied the works. The plan of operations, which Lee had doubtless been maturing on the 28th, now took form rapidly. As no report had been received during the night of any appearance of the Federals on the lower Chickahominy, Lee considered it almost certain that McClellan was making for the James River, but as the enemy might have been delayed in his retreat, Lee could not completely put aside the possibility that his opponent was making for the peninsula, even though Ewell and Stewart had as yet seen nothing of him. Ewell and Stewart, therefore, had better be held where they were, guarding the lower bridges of the Chickahominy. The remainder of the army should be put in pursuit of the enemy. Lacking, however, all information as to the line of McClellan's probable withdrawal to the James, Lee had to dispose his forces anew in the most practicable manner to meet his adversary on any route that he might follow. This was a difficult task in detail, but if it were rightly performed Lee believed that he could keep McClellan from reaching the James River. The distance from Gaines's mill to the James was too great for the whole army to get in front of McClellan's moving army before nightfall of the 29th. The main battle would have to be fought on the 30th. In his retreat, however, McClellan would have to take his whole army across White Oak Swamp, a troublesome miniature of the Chickahominy that ran from McClellan's left into the larger stream midway between Bottoms Bridge and the Long Bridges. McClellan's leading corps doubtless would be able to reach the south side of White Oak Swamp that day, but if his rear was pressed with vigor part of his army might be cut off north of that stream. There were, then, two battles to be planned, first the attack on the rear guard that day and a general engagement on the 30th. How was the army to be disposed for these successive operations? Jackson was opposite Grapevine Bridge, which of course must be rebuilt at once. Should it develop, after all, that McClellan was making for the lower crossings of the Chickahominy, Jackson could march down the left bank and support Ewell and Stewart. Otherwise, he could cross the bridge when it was completed and could march down the right bank, available either to support the attack on the rear guard or to cut off the Federals if they were balked at White Oak Swamp and attempted to march onto the lower bridges over the Chickahominy. Magruder could move down the Williamsburg Road. Then, when the Federal rear guard had been cut off, Magruder and probably Jackson also could cross the swamp and again assail the rear. Huger, by going down the Charles City Road, would be on the Federals' flank. Longstreet and A. P. Hill should be placed well to the south or to the southwest of White Oak Swamp, where they could strike McClellan in flank or in front, according to his position on the 30th. Based on this reasoning, orders were issued for movements on the 29th as follows. 1. Ewell to remain at Bottoms Bridge, guarding the crossing. 2. Stewart to watch the lower passages of the Chickahominy. 3. Jackson to rebuild Grapevine Bridge and, in the absence of other instructions, to cross and move down the right bank of the Chickahominy, supporting Magruder and moving against the enemy with all speed. For Magruder to pursue vigorously the Federal rear down the Williamsburg Road and engage it before it reached White Oak Swamp. 5. Huger to follow the Charles City Road and to take the Federals in flank at White Oak Swamp or before they reached that point. 6. Longstreet, commanding his own and 8. Pete Hill's division, to cross the Chickahominy at New Bridge and to take the shortest route to the Darbytown Road, thence down that highway into position on the Long Bridge Road to intercept the Federal retreat to the James. The general plan of advance was to be as shown on page 170. At P. Hills and Longstreet's men, having been prepared for immediate movement, were able to start as soon as these orders were received. Lee hurried ahead of them to explain to Magruder and to Huger in person what was expected of them. Crossing New Bridge, he sent Colonel Chilton forward to find Magruder.
When Magruder had reported, Lee went forward with him down the nine-mile road, Lee reviewing the plan of operations. Magruder, however, was greatly excited and much preoccupied with the movement of his own division and, as it subsequently developed, got the impression that Huger was to take the Williamsburg Road, whereas Huger was to advance down the Charles City Road. Lee remained with Magruder until they were well inside the former Federal lines at Fair Oaks Station, and then he hastened to General Huger's headquarters on the Williamsburg Road. General Huger, he discovered, had been into the evacuated federal position and had then ridden along the front announcing to his men the news of the federal retreat. The advance of his troops was underway but seems to have been slow and poorly organized. At length, when Huger went on with his command, Lee decided to remain for the time at Huger's quarters, which were conveniently placed for ready communication with Longstreet and A. P. Hill as well as with Huger and Magruder. Lee did not attempt to arrange the tactical details of the expected action against the rear of the enemy, but left these to General Magruder. Already the day was intensely hot, and as the roads were now dust-covered, the march of the pursuit column would be hard and miserable, but otherwise nothing happened to indicate any miscarriage of plans until there arrived a dispatch from Magruder at Fair Oaks, stating that a strong force was in his front and was moving against him. Lee seems to have discounted this, perhaps attributing the report of an enemy advance to General Magruder's excitement, but as the two rear brigades of Huger's division had not marched far, he ordered them recalled and had them moved over to the Williamsburg Road. Fearing, however, that this might involve a halt by the whole division, Lee in a short while sent Huger a note in which he reminded him of the importance of advancing rapidly down the Charles City Road. If Magruder did not need assistance, Huger was to move on. Nothing further, it would seem, was heard from Magruder or from Huger for some hours. Lee had no apprehension, for Jackson's advance from Grapevine Bridge would inevitably turn the flank of any federal column that might have been drawn up across the Williamsburg Road to halt Magruder's pursuit. Smoke climbed high from piles of abandoned stores to which the retreating federals had set fire during the night. From the east, the dust still rose in a mighty column. Here in their farmhouses, barns, and haystacks were smoldering from an incendiary torch. The fields over which the enemy had retreated were littered with accoutrements and arms. By the roadside stood abandoned wagons and broken ambulances. At Lee's temporary headquarters there was the same fog of war that somehow had prevailed from the beginning of the campaign. Few couriers came and those few brought little news. Either the majority of the division commanders did not appreciate the necessity of keeping G.H.Q. informed, or else each of them was acting as if he were exercising independent command and under no necessity of coordinating his movements with the others. Stewart, who had gone on from dispatch station to the White House, reported that base abandoned, vast stores burned, and Rooney Lee's historic home destroyed. The cavalry commander was satisfied that the enemy's movement was toward the James and that McClellan had no intention of retreating down the peninsula. Word reached Lee, also, that General T. H. H. Holmes, with 6,000 of his men, had crossed to the north side of the James by the pontoon bridges at Drury's Bluff and had been ordered by the War Department to move down the left bank of that river by way of the new market road to cooperate with Lee, a very welcome reinforcement, nearly compensating for the casualties at Gaines's Mill. As the day closed, it was believed at headquarters that the enemy might be headed off at the intersection of the Long Bridge and Charles City Roads, a place familiar in later campaigns as Riddell's Shop. This was, in reality, most improbable, because so great an army, with its wagon train, could not be crowded into the space between Riddell's Shop and the known rear of the enemy, but Stuart was ordered across the Chickahominy to cooperate in an attack at the point where the head of the column was supposed at the moment to be. Longstreet and A. P. Hill had made a fair day's march, considering the heat and the dust, 13 miles. Their advance had reached Atley's farm on the Darby Town Road, though some of Hill's units had been compelled to keep the road until 9 p.m. The two divisions were still seven miles from Riddell's shops, but, by an early start on the 30th, could get there in time to head off McClellan if he were there. The news from the other commands was far less favorable, and it reached headquarters in a torrential rain that continued far into the night. Huger had done a wretched day. Bewildered by the dispatch of troops to and from Magruder, he had spent long hours in the road and then had hesitated in the belief that the enemy was still in White Oak Swamp on his flank. He had bivouacked at Brightwells, not more than six miles from his starting point. If this was the best that could be expected from a fresh division of 9,000, it augured ill for the morrow.
Magruder, it developed, had spent several hours at Fair Oaks in placing his troops in line of battle and then had waited for the expected arrival of Huger on his right and of Jackson on his left, in the hope of enveloping the Federal rear guard. Huger, exercising the discretion Lee had given him, had recalled his two brigades because he did not find any need or place for them. Jackson had not arrived. After a long delay, Magruder had attacked and had driven the Federals back to Savage Station, one of their advanced bases on the York River Railroad. Then he had brought into action the railroad battery that Lee early in June had asked the Navy Department to construct. Kershaw's and Sums's brigades of McClaws's division had assaulted a lightly fortified Federal position and had made some progress in a two-hour battle that had ended with darkness, but they had not routed the Federals or perceptibly hastened the withdrawal of the rear guard. The advance of the column for the day had been only five miles, the casualties had been 441, and the net result was that the Federals had another night in which to complete the crossing of White Oak Swamp, with two roads available to them across it. Lee was disappointed. He did not know the great strength of the force encountered by Magruder, and he wrote him in serious strain. I regret very much that you have made so little progress today in the pursuit of the enemy. In order to reap the fruits of our victory, the pursuit should be most vigorous. I must urge you, then, again to press on his rear rapidly and steadily. We must lose no more time or he will escape us entirely. After this letter had been written, late in the evening, but before it had been dispatched, Major Walter Taylor wrote in from an interview with General Magruder, to whom he had carried orders to feel out the enemy during the night. Taylor had a strange tale to tell. General D. R. Jones, commanding one of Magruder's small divisions, had been expecting Jackson's cooperation on his left, next the Chickahominy, but before the action at Savage Station had opened he had received word from Jackson that he could not help him, as he had other important duty to perform. Magruder had repeated this to Taylor, who had no knowledge of any conflicting orders for Jackson. Taylor had proposed to Magruder that he ride on to Grapevine Bridge, see Jackson, and ascertain what Jackson meant, but as the night was blackness itself and Taylor did not know the road, Magruder sent one of his own officers and Taylor returned to headquarters. Lee was as much in the dark as Magruder concerning Jackson's other important duty, though he knew, of course, that when he had left the north side of the Chickahominy that morning Jackson had not completed the rebuilding of Grapevine Bridge. So Lee added a postscript to the letter he had previously written Magruder. I learn from Major Taylor, he said, that you are under the impression that General Jackson has been ordered not to support you. On the contrary, he has been directed to do so and to push the pursuit vigorously. From Jackson himself, Lee had no words. This, then, was the position of the army at 10 p.m., June 29th. The situation was by no means what Lee had hoped it would be at the end of the day's operations. The Union rear guard had not been caught on the north side of White Oak Swamp, the columns pursuing the Federal rear were not yet close to the swamp, there was growing improbability that the head of McClellan's column could be in the vicinity of Riddell's shop. The day's operations had been a failure, not to say a fiasco. Still, the enemy would be within striking distance the next day, if only for that one day. McClellan doubtless was crossing White Oak Swamp and might have the rear of his army across before morning, but he would be strung out along the roads. And he would be bound for the James River. Of that, Lee was now fully satisfied. Had McClellan been moving toward the lower Chickahominy, Stuart and Ewell would certainly have had some evidence of his proximity ere this. They had reported none. If McClellan was not headed off at the junction of the Long Bridge and Charles City Roads, by what route would he make for the river? Lee did not know, and he ordered such cavalry as he had at hand to make a bold scout and to ascertain the enemy's position. The result was a bloody repulse for the Confederate horsemen on the Willis Church Road, which led to the James. Little else was established except that the enemy was well to the south of Riddell's shop. Was it possible to dispose the Army of Northern Virginia so as to cut McClellan off before he reached the James? As Lee pondered that question, he saw a possibility of attacking the enemy on the move. Then, if he demoralized and defeated the Federals, he would have a chance of enveloping them. Holmes was close to the river and too weak to interpose his division between the enemy and the James, but he could cover the extreme right flank and would be available in case the enemy were broken and fled in disorder toward the James. Longstreet, A. P. Hill, and Huger would be on McClellan's flank.
By crossing White Oak Swamp, Jackson's strong column would be in rear of the Army of the Potomac. Magruder could be brought around White Oak Swamp as a general reserve. A great opportunity was presented for a convergence of force in a simultaneous attack on a moving enemy encumbered with a great wagon train. Lee determined to make the effort, hopeful of large results. Orders were prepared as follows for the movement of the different columns, beginning on the Confederate right. 1. Homes to advance down the New Market Road and take a strong defensive position at New Market Heights near the junction of his route and the Long Bridge Road. 2. Magruder to return from Savage Station, enter the Darby Town Road by the shortest byway, advance down it, and take position as a general reserve. 3. Long Street and A. P. Hill to continue down the Darby Town Road to the Long Bridge Road and to be prepared to attack the Federals when and where located. 4. Huger to march down the Charles City Road and to open with his artillery when he established contact with the enemy. 5. Jackson, with Whiting and D. H. Hill, to march to White Oak Swamp Bridge, cross there, and attack the enemy in rear. 6. Stewart's previous orders to stand, to move to the main army and to cooperate as circumstance permitted. 7. The movements at dawn. As Huger was nearest the enemy, the opening of his guns to be the signal for the advance of the attacking columns. All these orders, except those for Magruder, were issued while the storm was still raging around Savage Station. After it passed, silence settled over the countryside. The only dispatch of any importance that arrived late in the night was one from the sleepless and excited Magruder. Regarding the situation as by no means satisfactory, he asked for reinforcements in case Jackson did not arrive. Lee thought them unnecessary and did not send them. Chapter 16 The Army Shows Itself Unready for a Canny Fraser's Farm The decisive day, June 30, broke cloudless and calm upon awakening thousands of confident soldiers who expected McClellan's army to be destroyed ere night fell again over the swamps and forests below Richmond. Lee's first concern was for Magruder. Riding down to Savage Station, he found that Jackson had joined Prince John at 3.30 a.m. Jackson, it is recorded by a young artillerist, appeared worn down to the lowest point of flesh consistent with effective service. His hair, skin, eyes and clothes were all one neutral dust tint, and his badges of rank so dulled and tarnished as to be scarcely perceptible. When Lee recognized Jackson he rode forward with a courier, his staff halting. As he gracefully dismounted, handing his bridle rein to his attendant, and advanced, drawing his gauntlet from his right hand, Jackson flung himself from his horse and advanced to meet Lee, little Sorrel trotting back to the staff, where a courier secured him. The two generals greeted each other warmly, but wasted no time upon the greeting. They stood facing each other. Jackson began talking in a jerky, impetuous way, meanwhile drawing a diagram on the ground with the toe of his right boot. He traced two sides of a triangle with promptness and decision, then starting at the end of the second line, began to draw a third projected toward the first. This third line he traced slowly and with hesitation, alternately looking up at Lee's face and down at the diagram, meanwhile talking earnestly, and when at last the third line crossed the first and the triangle was complete, he raised his foot and stamped it down with emphasis saying we've got him, then signaled for his horse. There is no further record of what passed between the two, but it is certain that Jackson understood the plan of operations and his part in it. Lee doubtless reiterated Jackson's simple instructions to pursue the enemy on the road he had taken. Jackson hurried on, Lee sought out Magruder. In person he gave Prince John his orders to move over to the Darby Town Road and supplied him with a guide who knew the terrain. Then Lee went across the country to the Darby Town Road and joined Longstreet's marching men. Before noon the force approached the junction with Long Bridge Road. As Longstreet had not ridden up, Lee directed A. P. Hill to take temporary command of his own and of Longstreet's division. Accompanied by R. H. Anderson, Longstreet's senior brigadier, Hill examined the ground with care. As far as could be ascertained, the enemy was in motion southward down the Willis Church Road, some two miles to the east of the Confederate van. The Long Bridge Road, as it chanced, ran eastward at this point, before turning northeastward toward Riddell's shop, consequently Hill had only to march up the road, in an easterly direction, to approach the enemy. Quickly he formed line of battle on the road, with Longstreet's division in front, supported on the right by Branch's brigade of Hill's own command. 
the light division was placed in immediate reserve. Soon the advancing infantry came upon a small force of Confederate cavalry engaged with Federal skirmishers. McClellan evidently was on the alert and had troops west of the road on which he was hurrying southward. About this time, Longstreet arrived in person and, at Lee's order, assumed charge of the field. While the troops moved confidently into position under Longstreet's direction, over ground thickly set with forest and underbrush, Lee sent back to ascertain how Magruder was progressing. He had no word from Jackson. Huger dispatched a messenger to report that his progress was obstructed, but his march was so short that it hardly seemed possible he would be held up long. As, however, there was prospect of some delay on his part in opening the action, Lee sent back to Magruder to halt and rest his men, so that they would not be fatigued when put into action. Close to 2.30 p.m., there came from the direction of Huger's advance the sound of light artillery fire. It was the signal gun, everyone supposed. Lee at once rode forward to join Longstreet. In a little clearing of broomstraw and small pines, he found Longstreet and with him Mr. Davis. Why, General, said the President, what are you doing here? You are in too dangerous a position for the commander of the army. I'm trying, Lee answered, to find out something about the movements and plans of those people. But you must excuse me, Mr. President, for asking what you are doing here and for suggesting that this is no proper place for the commander-in-chief of all our armies. Davis was determined that Lee should not send him off as he had done at Mechanicsville, and he answered lightly. Oh, I am here on the same mission that you are. They chatted cheerfully, their spirits high, as they waited for Huger's artillery to open in heavier volume to cover the advance of his infantry. Longstreet had sent word for nearby batteries to fire a few rounds in acknowledgement of what he took to be Huger's signal, but almost before the southern gunners could do so the Federal artillery opened and its shells began to burst close by. Just then a P. Hill dashed up, this is no place for either of you, he exclaimed, doubtless with a smile that kept his words from being insubordinate, and as commander of this part of the field, I order you both to the rear. We will obey your orders, said Davis, and moved off. Lee had to follow. A short distance away the president halted, still within range. A. P. Hill would not have it. In the same solicitous tone, he inquired, did I not tell you to go away from here, and did you not promise to obey my orders? Why, one shot from that battery over yonder may presently deprive the Confederacy of its president and the Army of Northern Virginia of its commander. This time they had to retire, and were fortunate to escape with no fatality. It was now almost three o'clock and the fire from Huger's position did not swell any louder or seem any nearer. Soon our H. Anderson's brigade of Longstreet's division became lightly engaged with the enemy's infantry, and by three o'clock the artillery on both sides was barking viciously, regardless of what Huger and Jackson might or might not be doing. At his field headquarters, in rear of Longstreet's stout-hearted regiments, a courier handed Lee a note from Colonel Thomas L. Rosser, commanding the 5th Virginia Cavalry, which was operating in front of Holmes, on the New Market Road. Lee must have read it with a sudden consciousness that the outlook was not so favorable as it seemed. For Rosser reported that the enemy's column, with much haste and confusion, was then moving southward over Malvern Hill, which was within little more than gunshot from the James River. Lee perhaps remembered Malvern Hill, or, more properly Malvern Hills, as one of the large estates of his grandfather, Charles Carter, but if he had ever ridden over the ground, he had done so long before, in boyhood, at an age when he had no thought of military positions. He knew little or nothing of the sinister strength of its heights. What shook him now from the confidence of victory was the realization that if the enemy was retreating over Malvern Hill, McClellan might already be escaping before the battle was joined. Instead of fighting the decisive battle on the day of his great opportunity, Lee might have in prospect little more than a bootless rearguard action. It was not a matter about which to take the word of a subordinate. He must see for himself. Apprising Longstreet of what was reported, and leaving to him the direction of the brewing battle and the employment of Magruder's reserve division, Lee galloped down the Long Bridge Road to its junction with the New Market Road and hurried eastward along the New Market or River Road. He found that Holmes already was aware of the enemy's movement and was sending forward six guns, supported by a regiment of infantry. Making his way through these troops, Lee undertook a reconnaissance in person, close to the enemy's position.
This soon showed him that Rosser's report was all too true. The federal columns were plainly visible on the elevation toward which Lee was looking. Returning from his reconnaissance, conscious that opportunity was slipping through his fingers, Lee met Holmes riding forward and directed him to bring up the rest of his division to support his batteries and then to open fire, in the hope of doing what damage he could to the retreating column. A little farther on the way back from Holmes's advance position, Lee again encountered President Davis, who also had heard of the menacing new situation near the river and had ridden down to see what was afoot. For a second time Davis protested that Lee was rashly exposing himself. The general replied, truly enough, that the only way he could get accurate information was by personal examination of the ground. Then he galloped back to the main field of action, whence there rolled an increasing volume of artillery fire. As he rode on, there came ominously from the opposite direction a still louder roar of heavier ordnance, federal gunboats were in the river and were opening fire across the flats over which Holmes's green troops had to advance. If McClellan's army was already getting under the cover of those guns, the game was up. When Lee reached the troops on the Long Bridge Road, he found the artillery blazing away, but the infantry not yet fully engaged. Magruder had been ordered by Longstreet to march to the support of Holmes. Nothing further had been heard from Huger and nothing from Jackson. Neither of them could be attacking successfully, if at all, because such reconnaissance as could be made by Lee showed that the federal right and center, which would have been exposed to assaults by Jackson and Huger, were standing staunchly, apparently inviting the Confederates to attack. It was manifest that if Longstreet and Hill waited much longer, the enemy would have passed their front and would have escaped. Dangerous and difficult as it was to order an advance with only two divisions against a force of unknown strength, Lee had either to use the troops he had or else let slip all opportunity of striking McClellan. Without hesitation, though doubtless with deep regret at the weakness of the force he could bring to bear where he had expected to thrust with his full strength, Lee ordered an attack. As far as the enemy's position had been developed, when this order was given, McClellan, unprotected by earthworks, seemed to be across the Charles City Road and west of the Willis Church Road. The two formed an obtuse angle at Riddell's shop. This angle was bisected by the Long Bridge Road, on either side of which Longstreet was advancing. The country was flat, except on the Confederate right, where it was uneven and, at some points, almost precipitous. Woods covered the whole front, broken at intervals by the clearings of small farmhouses and at points almost impenetrable because of bogs and underbrush. The nearby settlement was known as Glendale and the largest property in the neighborhood was Fraser's Farm. The battle was to bear both names. At the moment the advance began, about five o'clock, Branch's brigade of Hill's division was on the Confederate right. On its left was Kemper's brigade of Longstreet, then, on its left, R. H. Anderson's brigade, commanded by Colonel Micah Jenkins, as Anderson was temporarily in command of Longstreet's division. Beyond Jenkins, toward the left, was Wilcox's brigade, astride the Long Bridge Road. Featherstone was on the extreme left. Pryor was in support of Wilcox. Pickett's brigade, commanded by Colonel Epahunton, was between Jenkins and Wilcox, slightly to the rear, but was soon shifted to the right. All Hill's division, except Branch's brigade, was an immediate reserve. Kemper's Virginians included many of the earliest volunteers of 1861 who had chafed at the fate that had denied them an active share in the battles of the campaign, and now that they had an opportunity they swept wildly forward. Hurling back the enemy's skirmishers, the men seemed to think they were close to the main federal position, and without waiting for orders, they raised the rebel yell and broke into the double quick. Through the wood they rushed, across a little field, through another boggy wood, crowded with underbrush, and into a second field some 600 or 700 yards square. In this, they discovered a barricaded log house, surrounded by a crude breastwork of rails. To the left and rear of this place, which was known as the Whitlock House, were two batteries of four guns each, which the Confederates took to be a unit. Undeterred by the fire from the breastwork, the house, and artillery, Kemper's men stormed onward, overran the house, captured six of the eight guns, and, though their line was irregular, pushed onto the woods east of the clearing. Here they found themselves facing a heavy fire from the front and from both flanks and saw that they had far outrun the brigades on either side of them. Determined to hold their ground, they made the best of their bad position and maintained a vigorous fire, though their right was soon threatened by what seemed to be a strong force. 
Branch, on Kemper's right, had no guide and floundered for some time, ignorant of the position of the other units. Then his men began slowly to advance. Jenkins, on Kemper's left, had started early, perhaps ahead of Kemper, but for some unexplained reason gained little ground. Wilcox, next Jenkins, was detained by conflicting orders for more than half an hour after Kemper went forward, but at 5.40 he advanced. Soon he noticed that the Long Bridge Road divided his two right regiments from those on his left, but his fine Alabama infantrymen pressed on, through woods, down to a little stream with a dense growth of trees along it, then through another wood, thin on the left of the road and heavy on the right. Here the brigade emerged into open ground and came under rifle fire. In the field could be seen infantry and two batteries, one on either side of the road. There was a cleared tract directly between the attacking force and the left battery, but behind the battery and to the left of it the woods were close enough to shelter the enemy's infantry. The 8th Alabama became engaged with the force in the woods on the left of the battery and could not progress, but the 11th Alabama, facing a very heavy fire, got within 100 yards of the battery before the fierceness of the Federal Defense forced it back. The regiment renewed the attack and this time came within 50 yards of the Federal guns, which were being admirably served by Lt. Allenson M. Randall. Once more the 11th gave ground, followed closely by the Bluecoats. There was a bitter clash, and the Union troops were forced to flee. This time the Alabamians were on their heels, and as the Federal infantry massed Randall's guns, Wilcox's men quickly overran the pieces. Randall's gunners, however, were of stubborn stuff, and after they had reached the edge of the woods in the rear of their battery, they rallied with infantry support and soon delivered a counterattack. The 11th Alabama held its ground. Bayonet crossed bayonet in a fierce melee. Captain W. C. Y. Parker felled two Federal officers with his sword, only to fall with three bayonet wounds and with a musket ball through his thigh. Heads were mashed with rifle butts. Primal rage possessed the struggling men. Decimated at last, the Alabamians were driven back to their right into the strip of woods flanking the road. On the other side of the road, the 9th and 10th Alabama had formed for the charge when they saw a Union regiment advancing through the field to attack them. Awaiting this onslaught, the Confederates received one volley, then sprang at the enemy and drove him back on the guns, which belonged to Cooper's battery. Close to these pieces, the Alabamians recoiled but rallied quickly and took the pieces. Soon the Federals attacked again and with so much violence that they compelled the Confederates to retire to the woods on the left, along the Long Bridge Road, where the 11th Regiment, driven from Randall's battery, had already sought cover. The Alabamians were still in advance, but they held less than they had sought to gain. The Federals contented themselves with what they had accomplished and did not attempt to recover Cooper's guns, which remained silent in the field, amid writhing horses and dying men. Pryor's brigade was to have gone into action on the left of Wilcox and simultaneously with him, but it encountered delay in the woods and did not reach the front until after Wilcox had been driven back from his most advanced position. Finding himself confronted with a heavy fire on front and flank, Pryor called for reinforcements from Featherston, who had been intended as a reserve but had already been ordered forward. Featherston formed on Pryor's left and advanced some distance. The enemy, however, seemed about to launch a flanking movement, so Featherston sent back for help and held on as best he could. Gregg, of Hill's division, was hurried to him. As sunset approached, the situation grew more serious. Kemper on the right and Wilcox on the center were spearheads held fast in the heavy blue line. They had inflicted heavy loss and had silenced all the enemy's batteries on a long sector or had forced the gunners to retreat, but neither brigade could be extricated or pushed farther to reach the vitals of the enemy. Both on the left and on the right, the Federal lines overlapped those of the Confederates and threatened to envelop them. The last brigade of Longstreet's division, that of General Pickett, was being marched to the endangered right. Magruder was out of reach on his way to Holmes. There was nothing to do but to throw in the remaining brigades of a P. Hill's division in an effort to consolidate and hold the ground already won. Longstreet, who was still directing the battle, gave orders accordingly. Forgetful of the slaughter of Mechanicsville and unmindful of their frightful losses at Gaines's Mill, Hill's regiments moved forward at the order of command. Archer was to the right, supporting Kemper and Branch, with Pickett on his right. Field, supported by Pender, went in to relieve Wilcox's brigade.
J. R. Anderson was prudently held back by Hill as a final reserve. About the time this advance began, Branch's slow progress was speeded up and he was drawn closer to the center. The brigade of Pickett passed through Kemper's lines and reached the federal batteries of Neerim and Diederich. Strange hesitated a while to employ the guns, believing that other Confederate commands were in his front, but at length he opened effectively on the enemy. The left of the line was threatened anew, as Branch shifted toward the center, but it was held against a vigorous fire. On the center, Field's Virginia Brigade divided as Wilcox's head in moving over the same ground, the 56th and the 60th Virginia on the right of the Long Bridge Road, and the 40th and the 47th Virginia Regiments and the 2nd Virginia Battalion on the left. The regiments on the right found Cooper's battery deserted but the enemy close behind it. Loading and firing as they advanced, the men reached the guns, recaptured them once more, and then pressed onto the woods in rear. Meantime, on the other side of the road, the 47th Virginia had driven off the Federals, who had recovered Randall's battery and were moving fast toward the woods. Together, the three regiments and the battalion pressed on. Finding the Federals in strength, the right regiments charged bayonets and soon were at grips with the enemy. One private of the 60th was confronted by four Federals at the same instant. Although several times stabbed with bayonets, he killed three of his four antagonists. The other was dispatched by his brother. Soon the 56th and the 60th of Virginia outdistanced the troopers on the left of the road and found themselves far in front. The 47th, halting near the edge of the woods, protected the flank of the other regiments as best it could and turned one of Randall's guns against the Federal position in the woods to the left. The 40th had drifted off in that direction and soon faced a fiery attack, which it successfully beat off, though the enemy got within 20 feet. Field now withdrew his right regiments from their exposed position. The enemy, however, by this time was closing in from the right and was actually in rear of Field, unknown both to him and to the Federal commander, but Pender's fine brigade was in support of Field, and when the enemy, moving from right to left across his front, was within 75 yards, Pender opened and quickly scattered it. Ere long, Archer was in touch with Pender on his right. Still the enemy fought hard. Close as the Confederate front had advanced to the Federal line, its ability to hold on was doubtful. Fortunately, A. P. Hill had followed the changing situation with a clear eye and he had already ordered forward his last reserve, J. R. Anderson's brigade, with instructions to raise the rebel yell in full voice. Through gathering darkness and in precise accord with his orders, Anderson moved up the road on a wide front and delivered a volley at close range. The loud outcry of his troops deceived the Federals into thinking that heavy, fresh reserves were at hand. They broke and ran. In a short time, with night lying black on the field, the infantry action was over. The artillery continued a blind fire until nine o'clock. Lee was with Longstreet during this last phase of the battle. While the excitement of the action was still upon them, a mounted officer rode up, surrounded by a guard of weary but proud Confederates, they were of the 47th Virginia and brought to the commander a live Federal general, whom they had bagged when he had ridden into their ranks in search of his scattered infantry. Longstreet recognized him at once as Brigadier General George A. McCall, commander of the 3rd Division of Porter's V Corps, whom he had known in the Old Army, as the Confederates always styled the antebellum military forces of the United States. Longstreet started to extend his hand as McCall dismounted, but saw instantly that the Federal was in no mood to accept amenities. He contented himself with directing that McCall be escorted to Richmond. McCall had commanded the Pennsylvania Reserves, who had repulsed a P. Hill at Beaver Dam Creek and had fought so stubbornly at Gaines's Mill. His presence was the first information Lee had, perhaps, as to the identity of the troops in front of the Confederate Center. There was a certain satisfaction in the knowledge that these stubborn soldiers had been defeated. The fact that their leader had strayed into the southern lines in the confusion of a retreat was as sure an evidence as the 18 captured guns that the Confederates had won the field. But the field was not the battle, and on the battle the campaign had hung. The enemy might resume the fighting at dawn, and even if he did not, it was as certain as anything could be that his wagon train by that time would be safe on the James River. The ambitious plan for the convergence of Jackson, Huger, Longstreet, A. P. Hill, Magruder, and Holmes had failed tragically. 
every man of Long Streets and Hills 20,000 had been thrown into action, leaving not a soldier in reserve, and more than 50,000 other Southern troops had stood virtually idle within sound of the guns. Magruder had not been able to bolster Holmes in an offensive below Malvern Hill, whither he had been sent. The advance of Holmes's infantry had raised so much dust that it had disclosed his presence to the enemy. An overwhelming artillery fire had paralyzed Holmes until nightfall and some of his raw artillery and cavalry had behaved very badly. Magruder, however, could now be recalled to relieve a P. Hill and Longstreet, though his men had marched so far that they would be well-nigh exhausted when they arrived. Stuart, by this time, should be on his way across the Chickahominy to cooperate. His men would help. But if Magruder's absence was justified and Stuart was accounted for, what of the others? Why had Huger failed to attack on Longstreet's left? What had happened to him? The answer was not given until the next morning and was then as brief as it was unsatisfactory. Huger had started down the Charles City Road from Brightwells at daybreak, very much concerned lest he be attacked on his left flank from White Oak Swamp. He threw Wright's brigade to the north side of the swamp to protect his flank and proceeded cautiously down the south side with the rest of his force. Before he had gone a mile, with Mahon's brigade in advance, he found trees felled across the road. Instead of leaving his artillery and pushing on through the woods, he started to make a new road around the obstructions. As his men chopped away with poor tools, the Federals continued to cut trees along the highway. In this unequal contest between road-making and road-blocking, the greater part of the day was passed. When the Federal rearguard was at length driven in, the main position of the enemy was found so strong that Huger and Mahone reconnoitered with much caution and finally brought up one battery. This opened the fire that Lee assumed to be the signal for beginning the attack on the Long Bridge Road. The battery continued its fire until dark and the supporting infantry sustained 78 casualties, but Huger made no assault. The day's operations ended with the advance less than two miles from its starting point. After reporting early that his road was blocked, Huger did nothing to communicate with Lee or to reinforce the left of Longstreet and Hill, though there was a woods road on Huger's right that would have carried him, after a march of about one and a half miles, to the ground where Featherston was fighting. It was inexcusable failure to cooperate, the result of extreme overcaution. So far as the records show, however, Lee sent no staff officer with further orders to Huger and did not call upon him to dispatch any part of his idle force to the right. The reason, perhaps, was that Lee was afraid to weaken Huger, as that officer's column afforded a measure of insurance that the overlapping federal right would not be pushed dangerously far in flanking operations against Longstreet's left. And what of Jackson on the federal rear? Why had he, too, failed to do his expected part? During the afternoon Longstreet had sent Major J. W. Fairfax back across White Oak Swamp to ask Jackson for reinforcements, and though there is no specific record of the fact, it is almost certain that Fairfax returned and, so far as he had seen the situation, reported what had befallen the 20,000 infantry on whose attack at White Oak Swamp Lee had reckoned in his plan of action. Jackson had not moved across the Chickahominy at Grapevine Bridge until after midnight on the night of June 2930, when he had been awakened by the storm. He did not explain then or thereafter the nature of the other important duty that kept him from supporting Magruder, as Lee had ordered. Ewell, meantime, had been ordered back via Grapevine Bridge and was marching in rear of Jackson's column. The advance on the morning of June 30 was so delayed by the collection of discarded federal small arms and by the capture of more than 1,000 prisoners that Jackson himself did not cover the seven miles to White Oak Swamp until about noon, and some of the troops did not come up till late afternoon. Had Jackson been a few hours earlier he would have caught the enemy in the act of crossing the bridge on the main road, for at daybreak federal stragglers had been wedged in so closely at the approach that for a time they could not move. As it was, the last of the organized rear guard was beyond reach when Jackson arrived. A fine pontoon train was in plain sight on the south side of the swamp and the enemy's wagons were moving slowly up the road toward Glendale, out of range. The bridge had been broken up and burned by the Federals, and the timbers had been thrown into the miry ford, which had thus been rendered almost impassable. A Federal battery was in waiting across the stream, with infantry in support. It was undeniably a difficult stream to pass in the face of the enemy. Woods came down to the swamp, a thick growth of small timber crowded it. 
Only the road was clear and that was commanded from the south bank by high ground on both sides of the crossing. At least one of the federal generals who had examined the position was of opinion that it could not be forced. Jackson's impulse, as always, was first to employ his guns. Crutchfield cut a road to a good artillery position to the right and rear of the crossing and about 1,000 yards from the enemy's battery. At 1.45 p.m. he opened with 23 pieces. The fire was overwhelming, according to the testimony of many federal officers. The enemy fired only four shots in reply and then withdrew, leaving one gun on the ground. A Confederate battery was at once moved into the road to deal with the federal sharpshooters, detachments were put to work repairing the bridge, and Munford's cavalry, with D. H. Hill's skirmishers, were promptly thrown across. The going was bad, but they were soon on the other side. Jackson and some of his officers also passed over to reconnoiter. Had the infantry followed without delay it might have succeeded in storming the federal position, for the enemy at the moment was badly demoralized. Soon, however, the federal infantry was rallied on a strong second line and the United States batteries were moved to the right of the road, directly opposite the Confederate artillery, out of sight but close enough to give the longer-range Parrot guns a great advantage over the Confederate ordnance. Discouraged by this maneuver, Jackson returned to the north side of the swamp, and the cavalry ere long retired also, but the skirmishers remained in the thicket. The troops reconstructing the bridge were now under a distant, random fire, and refused to work. Jackson had been in a peculiar mood early in the day, but had been smiling and hopeful when he had reached the swamp. During the engagement, he was active and energetic. During the afternoon, however, a strange inertia overwhelmed him. General Wright of Huger's division, who had crossed higher up the swamp during the morning, arrived at Jackson's position with his command and reported for orders. Jackson told him to retrace his steps and to cross the swamp again, if possible, as the enemy in large force was opposing him at the site of the bridge. The information as to his situation, Jackson directed Wright to convey to General Huger. Wright marched back with his troops and a competent guide, and though he found the nearest ford, brackets, guarded by the enemy, he had no difficulty in passing over White Oak Swamp at Fisher's Ford, only a little more than three miles from Jackson's artillery position. Jackson neither sent to see whether Wright would cross nor gave him instruction to report if he found a ford. Nothing further seems to have been done by Jackson to communicate with the forces on the other side of the swamp, though General D. H. Hill readily enough found a way of sending an engineer officer to Huger, requesting him to attack the force blocking the road at White Oak Bridge. The officer got back safely with a report on Huger's situation. General Wade Hampton, meantime, started to reconnoiter on the left, while the artillery continued its blind fire and the infantry waited, ready to move. A short distance from the road, where the swamp was only 10 or 15 feet wide, Hampton found a good sandy bottom and shallow water. He rode across the swamp and discovered that he was beyond the right flank of the Federals. They were lying down, at ease, having no guard at the creek and apparently not suspecting that an enemy was at hand. Riding back, Hampton reported his findings to Jackson. Could he build a bridge over the swamp at the point he had described? Jackson asked. Easily for infantry, Hampton answered, but not for artillery, as the cutting of a road would give the alarm. Jackson told him to set about it. In a few minutes the bridge was made, and Hampton went across again. He found the Federals still unaware of their danger. When he returned, he again reported to Jackson, who was sitting alone on a log by the roadside, his cap down over his eyes. Hampton announced that the bridge was ready. Jackson sat silent for a time and then got up and stalked off without saying a word. No orders were issued and nothing was done, though the sound of the opening of the battle at Fraser's farm ere long was audible. Instead of reconnoitering in person, Jackson sat down and penned a letter to his wife describing his loss of rest and advising her what money she should contribute to the church. At second hand, it is also said that Jackson fell asleep and either was not or could not be aroused by his staff officers. Night came. The roar of the battle at Fraser's farm continued to crash over White Oak Swamp. Jackson's artillery ceased firing. The men prepared to bivouac. The general started to eat supper with his staff but was so weary that he fell asleep with his food between his teeth. His sense of duty did not desert him even then.
Arousing himself he said, Now, gentlemen, let us at once to bed, and rise with the dawn and see if we cannot do something. Myths have grown up regarding Jackson's strange lapse that day, and many theories have developed from endless speculation that he was disgruntled at subordination to Lee, that he thought his weary troops should be spared while the Richmond garrison did some of the fighting, that he was deterred from seeking another ford because his orders were to cross where he was, that he did not cross because he could not carry his artillery with him, and that he did all that could be expected of any man. In such a position, with the enemy commanding the road. The evidence is not such that a positive choice can be made among these theories on the basis of determinable fact. Individual opinion of the weight of probabilities must shape one's conclusion. Most students probably will conclude that the most likely explanations are these either the position, in Jackson's judgment at the time, was so strong that he did not think he could take it without excessive and unwarranted casualties, or else, the none too robust frame of Jackson had been exhausted by lack of sleep, on which his physique was especially dependent. Perhaps the two reasons are one, in his normal state of mind, well rested, Jackson might have stormed the federal positions. However this may be, Fraser's farm was one of the great lost opportunities in Confederate military history. It was the bitterest disappointment Lee had ever sustained, and one that he could not conceal. Many times thereafter he was to discover a weak point in his adversary's line or a mistake in his antagonist's plan, but never again was he to find the enemy in full retreat across his front. Victories in the field were to be registered, but two years of open campaign were not to produce another situation where envelopment seemed possible. He had only that one day for a canny, and the army was not ready for it. Chapter 17 The Federal Artillery Proves Too Strong Malvern Hill At 2 a.m. on the morning of July 1, a year before the Battle of Gettysburg opened, to the very day, Magruder's troops arrived on the battlefield of Fraser's farm after their feudal march to the support of Holmes. The regiments had been moving almost continuously for 18 hours, without food, but they at once relieved Longstreet's and Hill's divisions, which were worn with much fighting. When they groped their way through the woods to their advanced position, the newcomers found the Federals still in their front. After an hour, as the dawn was graying, the skirmishers crept forward and discovered that the enemy was gone. Soon they established contact with Jackson, who had crossed White Oak Swamp after the enemy had abandoned the hill and was advancing, with Whiting's division in front. Shortly thereafter, Lee sent Major Taylor to bring up Huger. That officer received in a message from Longstreet his first intimation that the Charles City Road was clear. The depleted army was now united again for the last stage of a pursuit that everyone felt was well-nigh hopeless. Lee was on the Long Bridge Road when Jackson arrived at the Willis Church. His disappointment at the outcome of the previous day's failure to concentrate was apparent to all, his temper was not of the best and he was feeling unwell, but he bore himself calmly and talked quietly with Longstreet, A.P. Hill, and Magruder of the battle of the previous day. While they were discussing the situation, Surgeon N. F. Marsh of the 4th Pennsylvania Cavalry came up. He explained that he had been left with federal wounded at Willis Church and stated that Jackson had directed him to report to Lee. Protection and supplies for his men, he said, were needed. Lee at once promised such help as he could give and directed Longstreet to write a permit for Dr. Marsh to remain undisturbed with his charges. Longstreet engaged Marsh in conversation. Had the surgeon been in the battle? He asked. Yes, Marsh replied, he had. What troops had participated in it? Longstreet inquired. Marsh answered that he only knew of his own division, McCall's, which had fought over the very ground where they then were. Well, said Longstreet, McCall is safe in Richmond, but if his division had not offered the stubborn resistance it did on this road, we would have captured your whole army. Never mind, we will do it yet. Lee made no comment on this optimistic prediction. Doubtful, in his fatigue, whether he would be able to conduct the day's operations, he asked Longstreet to remain with him and then rode over to the Willis Church. There he found D. H. Hill, who was as pessimistic as Longstreet was hopeful. Hill explained that he had in his command a chaplain, Rev. W. L. Allen, who had lived in that vicinity and knew Malvern Hill well. He repeated a description Allen had given him of the great strength of the hill, and added, If General McClellan is there in strength, we had better let him alone. 
Longstreet broke in banteringly, don't get scared, now that we have him whipped. Hill naturally said no more, and Lee did not pursue the discussion. The orders for the march were then issued. Jackson, who was on the ground, was directed to take up the pursuit at once down the Willis Church Road. Magruder had already seen Jackson and had offered to lead the van, but Jackson had insisted on doing so, as his troops were fresher than Magruder's. Word was sent to Magruder, who had not ridden forward with Lee, to take the Quaker Road and to form on Jackson's right. Huger's division was divided. Two of his brigades, those of Armistead and Wright, were to advance, by a track through the woods, southward from the Charles City Road to the Long Bridge Road and were to move then southeastward toward Malvern Hill. Mahone and Ransom, leading Huger's other brigades, were to follow Jackson down the Willis Church Road. The divisions of Longstreet and A.P. Hill were to remain in reserve. They had done their part and were too weary to resume fighting immediately unless an emergency demanded their employment. Holmes was to hold his position and cooperate. It was tactically bad, of course, to send Jackson's three divisions, two brigades of Huger's and Magruder's three divisions, one behind another, down the narrow Willis Church Road, but there was no alternative. As far as Lee knew, there was no other approach to the federal flank or rear. He may, however, have read an omen of disaster in the crowding of so many bayonet thousands on one wooded route, for his grip on his temper began to fail him. When General Jubal A. Early came up to be assigned to command and expressed his concern lest McClellan escape, Lee answered grimly and with some impatience, yes, he will get away because I cannot have my orders carried out. His mind could not cease dwelling on the lost opportunity. A ride of two miles and a half down the Willis Church Road with Jackson's division brought Lee to the northern foot of the Malvern Hills. It was a peaceful, sleepy landscape in normal times. Past cleared and cultivated fields, a straight dirt road climbed to the crest of a wide hill. Atop it, set back on either side, were two planters' homes, surrounded with shade trees, bathed a lustrous, shimmering green in the morning sun. At another season, the quiet beauty of the scene would have stirred the nature-loving Lee, but now his anxious eyes could not fail to see that it was just such a position as the Federals had chosen at Ellerson's Mill and behind Boson's Swamp. There was a similar difficult approach, through a forest of pines, oaks, and chestnut. A little stream flowed in a swamp and a jungle, so situated that as the troops marched southward to take position on the center and right, they would be jammed together where they could be extricated only with the greatest difficulty. Beyond the swamp, toward the enemy, the slowly rising, open ground afforded an ideal field of defense. The Federals had their guns massed in a long crescent from west to northeast, with two lines of infantry in support on that part of their line facing the Southern Army. Most of their field artillery was placed in a lane running for a quarter of a mile, from the large, white crew house on the upper side of the ridge, eastward to the West House across the Willis Church Road. Beyond the West House other batteries guarded the Federal right. Every avenue of advance was covered by the guns. On Lee's left, the ground sloped gradually to the rising sun. On his right, beyond the range of his vision, the ridge fell abruptly away for fifty feet or more from the rear of the crew house to a meadow that skirted Malvern Hill for a mile toward the James. This meadow had been planted in wheat, which had been cut and placed in shocks, behind which federal sharpshooters were lurking. The enemy evidently was confident that no attack could be successful on that flank, for all the guns, most significantly, were trailed toward Lee's left. It was, altogether, an exceedingly formidable position. Had the Union engineers searched the whole countryside below Richmond, they could not have found ground more ideally set for the slaughter of an attacking army. It was a miniature Vimy Ridge, a Waterloo with a protected flank. One sweep of the field with his glasses was enough to show Lee the difficulty of attacking such a natural fortress. D. H. Hill had not exaggerated its strength. Nothing could be accomplished unless the enemy was badly demoralized, and even then an attack could not wisely be undertaken without a careful reconnaissance to uncover the vulnerable part of the terrain. This reconnaissance, of course, should be made at once. As the Confederate troops were advancing slowly down the Willis Church Road and would certainly be delayed in their deployment, Lee sent Longstreet to the right to study the ground and started toward the left himself. At the time, however, he did not undertake a detailed examination of the land in that quarter. The reason for his failure to do so is not plain.
He may have been too fatigued, he may have assumed that Jackson would reconnoiter. In a short time, Longstreet came back and reported. Magruder, he said, was far to the right on a road that he insisted was the Quaker road Lee had directed him to follow, when, in reality, Lee had intended him to march down the Willis Church Road and take position to the right of it. Magruder was correct, so far as the usual local names of the roads were concerned. Lee had certainly said the Quaker Road, because he had been told that this was the name of the road on which the rest of the army was moving. It was sometimes so styled, but was more generally known as Willis Church. The error, which was due to poor guides and poorer maps, meant that Magruder would be forced to make another troublesome countermarch. A staff officer was at once dispatched to correct the misunderstanding and to bring Magruder up. As two of the brigades of Huger's division were already close at hand on the Willis Church Road, Lee decided to place those brigades on Jackson's right, and he told Chilton to put Magruder in line to the right of Huger, a move of no small difficulty in the morass west of the Willis Church Road. Longstreet reported, however, that on the right of the Confederate position, where Magruder was to form, he had found an admirable artillery position. It was on a little knoll at an elevation equaling that on which the Federal batteries were standing. From that knoll, he had observed on the Confederate left a large open field that afforded a direct line of fire to the Union gun positions. Longstreet expressed the opinion that if the Confederate batteries were employed in full force on the knoll to the right and in the field to the left, they would bring to bear on the enemy a converging fire that would demoralize the northern artillerists and open the way for the Confederate infantry, as shown on page 206. D. H. Hill had sent all his guns to the rear from White Oak Swamp, as his ammunition was entirely exhausted, but the other divisional batteries were virtually intact and presumably nearby. The large force of reserve artillery, under General Pendleton, had now caught up with the army. It seemed perfectly feasible to concentrate ordnance as Longstreet suggested and to deliver one more blow at an enemy who apparently was inviting further punishment. In the absence of a better method of attack, and with no personal knowledge of conditions either on the Confederate right or on the left, Lee approved the plan. Longstreet was sent back to the right to locate the batteries on that flank, the Pioneer Corps was dispatched in the same direction to cut a road to the Knoll, word was given Jackson to concentrate his artillery on the left. When the Confederate guns had demoralized the enemy, all the infantry were to make a simultaneous assault and were to wrest Malvern Hill from the enemy. Ere this plan of action had been determined upon, the enemy's artillery had opened all along the front. Very heavy shells were falling far within the right of the Confederate position, shell at first assumed to come from Federal gunboats in the James River but later found to be fired by a battery of Federal siege guns, slightly more than three-quarters of a mile in rear of the front Union artillery position. Under this fire, heightened by that of many field pieces, Armistead and Wright of Huger's division, in accordance with Lee's instructions, made their way from the Long Bridge Road to the right of the Willis Church Road, under the north side of Malvern Hill, and were soon engaged with the enemy's skirmishers. If the action was to be a heavy bombardment, followed by an assault all along the line, how was the order to be given? As it happened, the position that Armistead had taken was close to the knoll where the artillery was to be placed on the right. Until Magruder arrived, Armistead's brigade was, likewise, to form the extreme right of the front of attack. Its commander would consequently be the first to observe the effect of the proposed converging fire and the logical man to start the advance. Lee accordingly directed that if Armistead found the Confederate fire breaking the Union line, he was to charge with a yell. This was to be the signal for all the divisions to assault together. An order to this effect was prepared by Colonel Chilton. It read as follows. July 1, 1862. Batteries have been established to rake the enemy's lines. If it is broken, as is probable, Armistead, who can witness the effect of the fire, has been ordered to charge with a yell. Do the same. R. H. Chilton. Assistant Adjutant General. This order was issued about 1.30 p.m. and was entrusted to staff officers and couriers who had to wander through an unfamiliar jungle in order to deliver the paper to the division commanders. There was no telling how long it would take to do this, especially as Magruder had not yet returned from his march down the wrong road. And now to bring up the artillery and to begin the bombardment. In thicket and swamp the infantry waited, some of the units well covered, others sustaining not a few casualties.
Minutes passed in suspense, for everyone knew it would be slow work pulling guns through the tangle on the Confederate center and right. At last, from the knoll behind Armistead, the sound of firing was heard. It was taken up on the left. Before men could do more than ask one another why the fire was so feeble, the Union guns answered with a defiant roar. In roaring crescendo, the Federal batteries found their target. The whole of the Union position was billowing smoke. Not a moment's intermission was there in the overwhelming fire. Presently word began to filter down the line that the Confederate guns were fast being silenced in an unequal exchange. Presently only the Union guns and an occasional weak reply from the Confederate side could be heard. On the right, as it subsequently developed, Armistead's guns had been far in the rear and substitute batteries had been called for. Only three had arrived. They had not opened simultaneously and were quickly blanketed. On the left, where Jackson's chief of artillery was sick, fire had been started when two batteries were in position. One of these had been knocked to pieces, the other had been under shelter and had been able to send its missile across the hill, two others were employed a little later and were well fought, though the impression had somehow been created that all the batteries were to be withdrawn. The reserve artillery did little or nothing. Instead of 100 guns, not more than 20 had been turned on the Federals at the same time. The preparatory bombardment, in short, was little more than a bloody farce, a futile sacrifice of some of the finest youth of Virginia. The long arm of Lee, as Colonel Jennings C. Wise has aptly styled the artillery of the Army of Northern Virginia, was paralyzed in one of the most critical hours of need the Army had thus far known. If the infantry advance depended on artillery preparation, there could be no general assault. By 2.30 p.m., the first phase of the battle was over and the situation was this, the Federal artillery had not been shaken and the Union infantry, except for some of the skirmishers, had not been engaged. Magruder was on the march to the right. He was ignorant of the progress of the battle and had not received Lee's orders about the bombardment or the attack that was to follow it, if practicable. Armistead, on the right of the line, had driven in the enemy's pickets and was loudly calling for more artillery. The other units that were to form the right center were slowly untangling themselves from the swamp and baffling woods. Nobody on that wing seemed to know who was in command or whence orders were emanating. Armistead did not realize that he was the ranking officer there. On the center and the left, D. H. Hills and Jackson's troops were forming, or in immediate reserve, but had no orders to attack. The few Confederate guns that had not been put out of action were continuing a vain fire. Confusion and uncertainty prevailed everywhere. Longstreet, and perhaps others, got the impression that no assault was to be made because of the strength of the Federal position. But up the Willis Church Road, at a pair of gateposts near the house of C. W. Smith, where Jackson had his headquarters, Lee was waiting and pondering and planning. A tenacity that he had never before had occasion to exhibit in battle showed itself, a tenacity that was to become one of his strongest military characteristics. He had pursued McClellan too long and at too heavy a cost to permit him to escape without one last challenge. If he had failed with his artillery, he would attempt a turning movement. Summoning Longstreet, he rode hurriedly to the east to see if there was any point beyond the federal flank from which he could advance and force McClellan to evacuate Malvern Hill. Arriving on the left, a hurried examination of the terrain convinced him that if high ground in that quarter could be seized he could accomplish his object. Had he looked more closely, he would have found a superb position, undefended by the enemy, where he could dispose his infantry, bring up his artillery and, by a swift, strong movement, not only force the evacuation of Malvern Hill but also, with good luck, cut off the enemy's retreat. How could Lee make this shift to the left? It was impossible, of course, to move any of the troops then engaged with or immediately facing the enemy. But the two divisions of Longstreet and of A.P. Hill were in reserve, weary and with thinned ranks, yet still serviceable. They could be utilized. Quickly Lee ordered Longstreet to move these troops to the left. Longstreet, who seemed cool and unwearied after nearly a week's hard fighting, galloped off to bring them forward. Whiting with his division had long been waiting under shell fire, but as the ground gave them protection, only their artillery suffered seriously. About this time, close to four o'clock, the Federal batteries suddenly ceased firing on Whiting's front.
Soon a horseman galloped up from that officer to Lee, who was returning to the center whiting, said the messenger, could see federal baggage trains and troops in motion, apparently in retreat from the field. Almost simultaneously, it would appear from the vague and conflicting reports, Captain A. G. Dickinson brought word that Magruder had arrived on the right and that Armistead had driven back a heavy force of the enemy and had gained an advantage that could be followed up. This news put the whole situation in a new light. It did not seem possible that the scattered Confederate artillery fire had broken the Federal line, but it might have demoralized the enemy. Armistead might have delivered a telling thrust on ground of which Lee had seen nothing and knew little. If the enemy was retreating in front of the Confederate left and was being driven on the Confederate right, then the course to follow obviously was to scrap the plan for a turning movement on the left and to attack on the whole front at once. Turning to Dickinson, who was Magruder's aide, Lee gave him verbal orders which the officer immediately wrote as follows. General Lee expects you to advance rapidly. He says it is reported the enemy is getting off. Press forward your whole command and follow up Armistead's successes. I will have Mahon's brigade in the place just occupied by Colonel Anderson. Ransom's brigade has gone on to reinforce General Cobb. Similar orders doubtless were sent to the other division commanders unless, indeed, Lee reasoned that when they heard Armistead cheer and saw him start forward they would take this to be the signal for the general assault authorized by the orders of 1.30 p.m. and not countermanded. Longstreet, at least, quickly understood and halted his movement to the left. The center of gravity in the battle now shifted to the right. Magruder had arrived there about four o'clock, very hot but vigorous and in high spirits. He found that Armistead had not received the additional artillery for which he had called but had repulsed the enemy's skirmishers about three o'clock and had then thrown forward three of his regiments. Although these Virginians had rashly advanced too far ahead of the main position, they had found some cover and had stubbornly held their ground. Sending immediately for his artillery, Magruder, in great excitement, began a characteristically reckless examination of the ground. Almost before he could complete it, he received for the first time the orderly had sent him about 1.30 p.m., telling him to advance at the sound of Armistead's cheering if the artillery preparation broke the enemy's line. As this paper did not carry the time of its dispatch, it was accepted by Magruder as a current order. He set to work immediately to prepare for its execution, in the midst of an intensified bombardment turned on him from the left as well as from the batteries in his front. Ere he could complete his dispositions, a courier brought him the message written a short time previously by Captain Dickinson. Magruder was fully conscious of the inadequacy of his artillery and before attacking he was anxious to get into position the guns for which he had sent, but he did not consider that Lee's repeated orders justified him in further delay. Making another quick reconnaissance, he determined to assault the front of the crew house hill and, simultaneously, to move troops down the flank of the hill into the edge of the wheat field so that he could attack from the west, also, under the brow of the hill. It was a desperately dangerous maneuver when unsupported by artillery, and it would never have been approved by Lee if he had seen the ground, but it seemed to Magruder the only course to follow in obeying instructions that he regarded as peremptory. Magruder had at hand Armistead's, Wright's, and Mahone's brigades of Huger's division. G. T. Anderson's, Semmes's, and Barksdale's brigades of his own command were within striking distance on his right. Cobb's brigade was in support of Armistead, and Kershaw was some distance to the rear. The combined strength of these troops was around 15,000. Wright's brigade from the Gulf states had been skirmishing heavily for some hours and was somewhat scattered. The Virginians of Mahone were fresh, though one of his regiments was temporarily lost. About 4.15 Wright carefully advanced his main line to the position of his skirmishers, under the shelter of the crew house hill, and at 4.45 he received the order to advance. Up from the depression sprang the sweating troops, with Mahone's brigade in support, full of the ardor of 1862 that made all the Confederates regard an infantry charge on a battery as the supreme glory of war. Almost as soon as the line started forward, the Federal gunners redoubled their fire. Ere long the supporting Federal infantry could make its musketry count. Wright's ranks were torn, Mahone's were thinned. Armistead's men, rallied by the appearance of troops on their right, swept onward. Every foot of advance brought heavier casualties. Still the men kept on until they were within 300 yards of the Federal gunners and in danger of being cut off by a force of Union soldiers that was deploying as if to flank them.
the fighting was close and the crossfire enough to shake the morale of veterans. Every discharge of the nearby Federal guns made the earth tremble under the panting Confederates. Nothing could be seen of other Confederate troops engaged on either flank. Magruder's main line was 1,000 yards in rear. To the men of the attacking brigades, it seemed as if they had been sent out alone to make a futile, unsupported charge and then to be killed off, one by one, huddled under the edge of the hill. They began to waver as they feverishly loaded and fired. It could be only a matter of minutes before they would break for the rear to be wiped out as they ran. Just then there came the roll of nervous musketry on the left, and soon D. H. Hill's division was seen advancing from the Confederate center on either side of the Willis Church Road. Hill had heard cheering as right and Mahone had advanced, and he had taken this to be the signal for the charge that Armistead was to have initiated in accordance with the original plan of attack. As quickly as might be, in a jungle of forest and vines, swamps and underbrush, where the voice of command could be heard only a few paces, D. H. Hill had pushed all his brigades forward, and now they were advancing up an incline of 700 or 800 yards that designing nature seemed to have set at that very point to lure on the incautious. The grade was so gradual that it did not discourage the attacking force, but all of it was exposed, and the ground nearest the Federals had been plowed. The enemy had an almost perfect field of fire. Inspired by the appearance of Hill's men, Armistead made still another attempt. Wright and Mahone dashed across the shoulder of a ridge and reached a hollow not more than 75 yards from the enemy. They were now so near the steep brow of the hill that the men had to kneel to load and expose their heads to the enemy every time they rose to fire. Hill's division by this time was feeling the full, blasting force of the Union shell and canister. The Confederate gunners could not interrupt this fire, much less silence it, because very little of Magruder's artillery, though it was close by, could be brought into position. Garland's brigade, distinguished at Gaines's mill, covered 400 of the 800 yards to the Federal batteries and then had to lie down and await reinforcements. Colonel John B. Gordon of Georgia, destined to larger fame, led Rhodes's brigade forward in the absence of its sick commander and brought it within 200 yards of the nearest battery, only to be compelled to halt. The colors of the 3D Alabama were both symbol and target in Gordon's advance. Six men were shot down carrying the flag, the staff itself was shattered, and the bunting literally cut to bits. The seventh color bearer brought off only part of the staff. Ripley advanced with the other brigades like them had to stop. Colquitt was brought to a standstill, G. B. Anderson could not reach the batteries that were decimating his North Carolinians. Lee had gone to Magruder's front soon after the attack began and was now with General McClaws, one of Magruder's division commanders. On receipt of a call from Magruder he undertook to hasten McClaws's men to the support of Armistead, Mahone, and Wright. Could all Magruder's troops be thrown immediately into action, while D. H. Hill's attack was occupying the Federal Center, there was still a chance that the Federal right might be stormed, impregnable though its position seemed. But the chance seemed remote. Most of the reserves on the right were exhausted by hunger and hard marching and had suffered heavily from straggling. Semmes's brigade of McClaws's division could muster only 557 muskets, and Kershaw had only 956. As they advanced from the northwest across Carter's Field, the two brigades became separated and lost touch with each other. Cobb's strong brigade of 2,700 men had only 1,500 left after a day and a half on the road, though it had suffered few casualties. However, they must be thrown into the battle now. The confusion was maddening. Magruder, unaware of Lee's proximity, thought he was about to be attacked and hurriedly called on Longstreet for reinforcements. Longstreet started a P. Hill toward him and moved his own division to protect Magruder's right flank. Ransom, who had been attached to Huger, had already been called upon by Magruder for help, but refused for a long time to move without Huger's approval. Barksdale and G. T. Anderson, of Magruder's command, encountered a rain of shell as they attempted to go on. As far as the general advance of this attacking wing of the army could be said to have taken form at this time, it was soon drifting so far to the left that Lee had to send word to Magruder to press more to his right. This order served only to confuse the excited Magruder still more, though he strove his utmost to change direction. 
D. H. Hill, meantime, had called for reinforcements from Jackson, whose men had done nothing all day except support the artillery that was firing on the Federal left. Whiting seems to have felt that the attack was confined to the Confederate right, Jackson apparently regarded the Union position in his front as impregnable. He had, however, already ordered up that part of Ewell's division in reserve and had sent back word for his own division to move forward. But the Willis Church Road, the only direct avenue of approach, was crowded with artillery and fugitives and was almost impassable. As General Early tried to carry his brigade toward D. H. Hill's right, by moving in rear of the center brigades, he encountered so many skulkers and disorganized troops that he lost touch with his own men. The clear, hot day was about to end. The steady breeze, which had tempered the sun's heat on the federal position, had cleared the air. Sounds were more distinct, the fighting seemed closer. The mist of evening was beginning to rise from the wheat field on the eastern edge of which Mahone and Wright were still desperately struggling. The last moment was at hand when a Confederate victory could possibly be wrested from the chaos of a costly contest. Would the climax of Gaines's mill be repeated in a sudden, resistless charge at twilight, with every brigade somehow finding its place in the line of battle? The confident roar of the unwearied federal batteries gave a mocking answer. The move on the left that Whiting had taken as a sign of retreat had not weakened the enemy's resistance. Toombs's brigade came up in support of D. H. Hill. It reached the crest of the hill, broke in blood and then flowed back to the woods. Garland had shot his bolt. Even Gordon had retreated. Fire from bewildered troops in their rear was adding to the losses of Ripley and of Kershaw. Winder and Trimble were pressing their men forward through the woods. Ewell was crashing furiously in a jungle. All these troops were moving as rapidly as the ground permitted, but none of them could hope to reach the line in time to support the assault before night fell. On the right, by this time, Magruder's weary reserve brigades were coming into action, but they were now under an artillery fire that wrecked or demoralized them. Most of them opened their volleys too soon and too high. Few of them got to grips with the foe. Semmes's brigade, facing musketry from friends on its flank, had to withdraw. Only Ransom, late to start an answer to Magruder's repeated appeals, got close enough to give any real assistance to Wright and Mahone, and he attacked almost west of the crew house, on ground that would have been a slaughter pen had not the mist somewhat obscured his movement. Unsustained and uninstructed, his men stormed within twenty yards of the enemy's guns and then fell back to the position from which they had charged. The gory remnants of Wright's and Mahone's brigades were facing over the brow of the crew house an enemy that seemed strong enough to smother them and was, besides, well protected by the undulations of the ground. Armistead, who had advanced before Mahone and Wright and then had charged with them, delivered three more assaults. There was a moment when the furious onslaught of these few men made the issue doubtful. One of the finest of the Union batteries was forced to limber up when the Confederates got within revolver range. Griffin's Federal Brigade, which had borne the heaviest of the infantry fight, was compelled to give ground. An hour more of daylight and a little more vigor on the part of Magruder's weary troops might have spelled a triumph as incredible as that of Missionary Ridge. But it was too late. Darkness had now settled. Hill's division withdrew, Magruder's supporting brigades returned as they had come, only Wright and Mahone clung to their most advanced position. The assault had been grandly heroic on the right, as D. H. Hill subsequently wrote an apology for early strictures on Magruder, but it was not war, it was murder. The field was in the utmost confusion and the moonless night was red and glowing from the long-continued fire of the artillery when Lee had at last to admit to himself that the day had ended in failure. No one knew where the troops were or what they would face on the morrow. Only those wounded who were lying close to the Confederate position could be succored, for fear of new collisions with the enemy. When the artillery finally ceased between 9 and 10 p.m., the heartbreaking calls from agonizing boys on the hillside gave the night a ghastly terror rivaling that of the day. Wearily and with a heavy heart, Lee made such dispositions as he could for safety of the lines and the comfort of the fallen. He realized fully that he had made a mistake in permitting the right wing of the army to attack a position the strength of which he had not known until he had arrived on that part of the line after the general assault had begun. He probably wondered why Magruder had not sent to him and reported the hopelessness of a charge on that flank.
As he rode sadly among the bivouacs, he found Magruder, who was just preparing to lie down on blankets that had been spread for him. General Magruder, he asked, why did you attack? Magruder answered unhesitatingly, in obedience to your orders, twice repeated. Lee said nothing in reply, for there was nothing to say. The orders had been issued, and if Magruder had felt it his duty to obey them, without waiting to explain, discipline came before discretion. As night wore on, to the wild accompaniment of the cries of the wounded, Stuart came up after a long ride from the Chickahominy and reported that his cavalry were bivouacked not far from the line of possible federal retreat down the river. He was ordered to await developments. If any report at all came from Holmes that night, it was to the effect that he had been unable to advance against a federal position dominated by strong artillery and well guarded by infantry. Midnight brought alarms. General Early distinctly heard the rumbling of wheels, indicating a movement of the enemy's artillery. Jackson, who had gone to bed very sleepy, was aroused at 1 a.m. by his division commanders, who wished to know what dispositions to make in case McClellan took the offensive at daylight. Jackson was very indifferent and asked few questions. No, he said, when asked if he wished to give any orders, I think he will clear out in the morning. And he went back to sleep. If Lee troubled a weary mind for answer to the same vexing question of the enemy's movement on the morrow, he probably was of like opinion, but with the sickening reflection that though McClellan had been forced to abandon his lines under the very shadows of Richmond's spires and had been struck hard and often, he had escaped the destruction Lee had planned for him.